We'll uh, start in a few minutes. Uh, we're just uh, uh, waiting for a few people to join us.
is now called to order. And um, before I call upon the committee secretary, let me recognize the presence of Senator Binay and Senator Cayetano. Um, let me uh, direct the committee secretary to acknowledge your resource persons for this afternoon. Good afternoon. May we acknowledge the virtual presence of Dr. Lee Sabi Martinez from the Depart uh, from the Deaf Education Council, uh, Ms. Carolyn B. Dagani, President Federation of the Deaf DEC member from the Department of Education, Dr. Jose Taginayo, Chief Bureau of Learning Delivery Student Inclusion Division, Ms. Annalyn Aquino, Ms. Nancy Pascual, uh, Ms. Erlinda Leva. And from the Valenzuela SPED, DEPED, Dr. Maria Teresita Yupangan, District Supervisor, SPED Administrator. From the Department of Finance, Ms. Sherman Odicta, Fiscal Policy and Planning Office. From the Department of Social Welfare and Development, Ms. Miramel Laksa, Division Chief of the Sectoral Program Unit. From INET Philippines, Ms. Mercy Chan, Advocacy Officer. From the Deaf Blind Support Philippines, Mr. Edgardo Garcia. From the Early Childhood Care and Development Council, Dr. Teresita de Mesa, Education Consultant. Ms. Mika Denise Del Mundo, Planning Officer 3. From the League of Cities of the Philippines, Ms. Veronica Hitosis, Deputy Executive Director for Policy, Programs, and Projects. Ms. Ann Janelle Rabe, Senior Policy Officer. And from the League of Provinces of the Philippines, Ms. Angelica Sanchez, Policy Director. From National Nutrition Council, Mr. Reginald Guillen, Nutrition Officer 4. From the National Parent Teachers and Association of the Philippines, Mr. Wilfredo Rodriguez, President. From Philippine Institute of Development Studies, PIDS, Dr. Aubrey Tabuga, Research Fellow. From the Philippine Normal University, Dr. Shirley Serbo, and Dr. Zanina Yoko Studio, faculty member, special education expert. From Save the Children, Ms. Shera May Paran, basic education advisor, and Ms. Attorney Emma Salmani, and Ms. Kathleen Reyes. From Technical Education, education and Skills Development Authority, TESDA, Director Marisa G. Legaspi, Executive Director, Attorney Clifford E. Pascual, Attorney 4, Mr. Celestino Millar, Chief TESDA Specialist Policy and Planning Division, Ms. Rea Dalumpines, Senior TESDA Specialist Policy and Planning Division. From the University of the Philippines College of Education, Dr. Teresa A. P. Bustos, Director, Assessment Curriculum and Technology Research Center. From the United Nations Educational and Scientific and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, Mr. Rex Hubach, Jr., Program Officer for Education, and Mr. Ludwig Kalambakal, Executive Assistant to Office of the Undersecretary for Strategic Communications and Research. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Comsec. Um... This is the second public hearing for what I call the Inclusive Education and Special Education Bills. There are 10 bills that were filed here in the Senate, all, uh, all dealing with inclusive education and uh, special education. Uh, one of the, one of the uh, authors is here who uh, who uh, was not around during our first hearing. And I know she is a staunch advocate of um, uh, inclusive education and promoting the welfare of children with disabilities of our country. I would like to hear from Senator Pia and any opening remarks or any comments um, regarding your proposal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon to everyone. Just a very quick remark. Um, I actually already uh, started hearings on these bills when I was chair of the committee in uh, the 16th Congress. 
um, unfortunately, it did not um, become a law. So I'm hoping that um, this Congress, we can make it into a law. Um, and a quick background for those who do not know me. Um, my personal interest in this is um, I had a child who was born with multiple disabilities. He was perceived to be blind, to be deaf, and I was told that he would never walk or talk. So um, although he passed away before he turned one, um, I actually um, have a foundation in his memory and have been working very closely with a lot of associations, particularly those associations that uh, cater to children with not the ailment that my, not the condition that my son had, because my son had trisomy 13, which is very rare, but the manifestations of that condition, which is being blind, uh, being deaf, and other disabilities. So, um, although I have no formal training in this area, I'm very, very close to my heart and working all over. And the, only, the one thing I'd like to emphasize as we listen to the um, experts is the reality that the needs of each child are very different. And I'm also cognizant of the limitations that our educational system has at present. With the, with the current size of our classroom, it would be very difficult for a, a regular teacher to accommodate um, children with special needs. So, and I know that in the first hearing, this was already taken up. So my, my, my thoughts really are, how do we support the teacher who will need to take on this added responsibility? Um, not just by way of training, but external support. And I don't, and I, I can't even remember because we drafted this bill many years ago, but um, we need to tap into um, the parents themselves to assist this. And um, of course, the professional, so those, those who, who uh, have degrees in special education, and I know there's also shortage in the country, um, but that's where I want to tap into. Uh, the parents and other volunteers who can help integrate these children into the classrooms. Beyond that, I also want to emphasize that there should be no stigma in having separate activities um, that will particularly cater to the needs of these children because I heard of some views that that um, espouse that all activities should be uh, inclusive. And I don't think that is practical. I, I, I believe that children have different abilities. So it, I, I hope that that is no longer an issue as it was in the previous um, hearings that I, I attended in the past. And uh, I'd like to leave with some example. Um, my son now, my, my 10 year old son, has a best friend. And when they moved to the United States, it was about and he was put in a special class because he had a, um, I guess, a learning disability, no? Um, and it only lasted for six months. Six months a year. And after that, the child adjusted. He's, he's, now, um, he's now considered a math genius, multi-awarded in the state, in the whole state where they live in. So I, I just want to object the stigma that this is not of special classes doesn't mean that there's something wrong with you. It means that we want to address that. Um, so anyway, I'll leave it at that, and then I'll just um, comment uh, when our other participants um, give their statement. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, for coming this hearing again. Thank you. Thank you, um, Senator uh, Pia. And I know you've been um, um, working on a lot of uh, legislation and policies to uh, take care of the welfare of our uh, children with special needs, children with disabilities, and uh, that's why uh, we took up this bill because uh, we see a lot of gaps and a lot of things that we need to strengthen in order to address um, their welfare. We also want to hear uh, Senator Binay if there are any opening comments. Uh, she's also one of the authors of the uh, Inclusive Education Bill. Senator Binay, any uh, opening uh, Comments? Senator Binay? Senator Binay? Senator Nancy, can you uh, hear us? I think we're encountering some technical errors, but uh, we'll hear from Senator Binay uh, later on. But this is actually a continuation of the previous hearing on inclusive education. And uh, thank you very much for submitting to us 
all your position papers and uh, uh, it really enriched the discussion and also the uh, uh, crafting of this bill. Um, today, we would like to discuss in depth uh, some of your position papers, especially um, people who have um, uh, who have extensive experience in inclusive education and also uh, this type of um, policies. Uh, we'd like to call on the Philippine National University who have submitted to us uh, actually two position papers on the said matter. I uh, would like uh, the Philippine Normal University to discuss with us uh, the concepts and your suggestions uh, as, it, as written down in the position paper. So we call on Dr. Shirley Serbo or, or Dr. Janina Custodio to discuss the uh, position paper of uh, the PNU. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Dr. Custodio. There I need for me to prepare the. Can I share my screen? Uh, we cannot see your presentation yet. There, we can see it. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. So, the Philippine Normal University International Center for Education. Uh, we are committed to provide discrimination education and we are aiming at delivering the best for preparation and development in the country. So we have um, undergraduates and we also have graduates. Um, I hope that I'm being able to do this. Um, I Anyone tell me that I'm still a bird? Yes, I, we can hear you and oh, we can see your presentation. You. All right, thank you. Um, just to move on, um, my, the first um, thing that again, you would like to highlight is the criminology. I mean, there are certain bills in chapter 44 and one month ago, um, both um, special. So, in the university, we would suggest that you have the term learners if the learners students with additional needs one um this would also refer to groups dr custodio are, dr custodio can you repeat that medyo nag choppy siya eh. can you repeat from the uh, beginning okay so for the Okay, so, so for the start, I think I must not be reading up. Yeah, mas malinaw na. Thank you. So, first of all, um, we are trying to share that the terminology should be chosen with utmost care and sensitivity. There are certain bills, um, such as 424 and 1150, um, that use the term special. In our country, kasi it has been a derogatory term, which implies abnormality. So there are certain groups of people with disabilities na niyayakas na din naman nila ang term na disability. So therefore, we, we should use the term disability as it is. Um, we don't have special rights. And we also believe that um, disability is categorized as a human condition. So therefore, it's a human right, it's a civil right, meron tayong disability right. Wala tayong tinatawag na special right. So we have to use the term disability. In other countries, um, ginagamit na nila yung term as one, students with additional needs naman. So pwede natin gawin it. Now, um, on the same note, we have the terminologies or the use of terminologies. Instead of using the phrase disabled person, um, mas magandang gamitin natin yung term na person with a disability 
or it is a more respectful na terminology kasi kapag sinabi natin na ah, itong person na to is disabled, minary na agad natin na itong tao na to, meron na siyang disability. So when we use the term with or person with disability, nagkakaroon tayo ng emphasis on the person and not on the person with disability. So um, meron dito sa Senate Bill 1150, it is now recommended that we use the phrase as learners with intellectual disability instead of intellectually disabled. Learners with orthopedic handicap instead of um, people na uh, instead of handicapped people. So um, also in Senate Bill 434, Section 4, kumamit naman sila ng term na in um, mental regulation. So the term is no longer used. Gamitin natin yung term na intellectual disability to refer to those people na mayroong intellectual disability. Now, hindi naman nasasakop itong suggestion na to ang lahat ng groups ng may disability because um, successful ang deaf community. They use the term uh, deaf to refer to themselves. At meron silang capitalized na letter D to refer to their group. So you can see that na it is identity uh, first principle ang ginagamit nila. So that will be the first one. That will be the use of terminology. Then the second one, on the functions of special education centers, we have SB 44 and 1150. Uh, they recommended that each SPED tender should have a SPED um, head for specialists. Sana ito pong specialist na to ay merong teaching load. Ay, sorry, wala siya sanang teaching load. Kasi maganda po yung mga bills na mga sinabi. However, sana po meron pong nagmamanage nung tinatawag natin na, na center. Would it be called as inclusive hub? Would it be called as special education center? So whatever that would be. Um, it is suggested na meron pong specialist or center head. So, ano pong trabaho niya? So, assess the needs of those with disabilities and gifted learners. Interpret tests that will help decide an appropriate placement of learners for regular ba siya? Doon ba siya sa special education center? Provide teacher training and orientation programs to stakeholders, kasama po dyan ng parents, caregivers. Next is to develop and monitor special and inclusive education plans and programs. Uh, other countries, ito po ay tinatawag na ICP or Individualized Education Plan. Um, ito po ay ginagawa ng mga expert, um, for example, doctor or pedic na, na doctors or uh, special education teachers or regular teachers. Wherein they tend to look at the goals tapos minit po nila yun ng isang taon. So it's something na, na kailangan po nilang plan. Then, develop and monitor special and inclusive education plans and programs. Collaborate with parents or caregivers. Kaya po na sinabi ni Madam Senator kanina na kailangan po, nandun po ang parents at saka po ang caregivers. But we also have to include LGUs and other stakeholders. Um, aside from those functions, pwede din po ang TESDA, MATAP for possible employment for graduates. I believe nakakuha po sila na people with the deaf community, meron po silang trabaho from that. But um, hindi po nakukuha yung other groups of people na may disability. We are also suggesting for that. Then conduct IEP meetings, keep records of students as well, and of course write and submit an accomplishment report either to CHED or to DEPTED. Yung po yung pangalawang function na, ah, yung po yung pangalawang suggestion. Now, for student assistance, nabanggit po ito sa Senate Bill 434 at saka 1150, dadagdagan lang po sana ng additional recommendations, which are, um, sana meron pong resource speakers from pool of focal point persons, um, reference materials na rin po for teaching strategies, Activities and projects relevant to the existing learner conditions with collaboration and support of education managers, teachers, community leaders, parents, LGUs, and other stakeholders. 
we have sign language and braille interpreters. Doon po sana tayo kukuha dun sa center. And medical and psychological teams. Now, yun po yung sa special education bills. Um, they are following pa po na recommendations for the inclusive bills. Una po sa lahat, um, ito po ata yung unang uh, sinabi ko sa first hearing, um, kailangan po natin ng matibay, strong na definition kung ano nga po ba ang inclusive education. Um, it is recommended that there should be a certain framework for the Philippines. But I, I understand meron po tayo sa DepEd na inclusive education na nakapaloob sa K-12, pero it will be much better if we have a unified definition of what an inclusive education is na talagang nasa konteksto po ng, ng Pilipinas. Because others would argue na ang inclusive education po ay pang may disabilities lang po. Pero kapag sinabi po natin inclusive education, that will include students or people na at risk, those po na galing sa war, um, those with religious um, interest, at saka po yung mga IP. So yung mga Senate bills po sana na nasa na may term po na inclusive education, it will be much better if we define nila para saan po kaya yung bill na tinatarget. And aside from the definition of inclusive education, kailangan din po ma-define yung difference ng inclusive at special education. Then, the receiving groups of the bills should be made clear. Therefore, the term inclusive education, nag-include po ba siya ng those with disabilities? Yung po ba may gifted, um, difficult circumstances, IPs, gifted and talented? Um, pero sa, sa university po, um, we are suggesting to include all these. Pero magbibigay po tayo ng emphasis to those with disabilities. Kasi ang needs po ng ibang groups na nabanggit ay mostly social and cultural. Then, we have an allocation sana for resource centers wherein ang experts, uh, mayroon po tayong buildings and structures. If ever na gagawin po natin itong term na inclusive, mayroon po tayong mga ecumenical prayer room interface and gender sensitive comfort rooms and other services should also be made. So, para saan po yung allocation? Ito po ay para sa instructional assistive devices for people with disabilities, shadow teachers, sign language interpreters, and teacher aides. Uh, we have physical accommodation for learners with physical disabilities kasi iba po ang upuan ng um, people with physical disabilities. Halimbawa po, may cerebral palsy. Um, kaliwete po, for example, na blind. So iba po ang kanyang test. We need uh, we also need braille writers for the blind. And of course, we need bigger classrooms to accommodate wheelchair users and sign language interpreters. Saan po, saan po sila papasok? Saan po mag stay na corner ang sign language interpreters? So as not to disrupt the other students na nasa loob po ng classroom. Then, um, we have build, uh, the allocation is also for the buildings and structures fund for PWD. So I understand meron naman po tayong building pa. Um, pero sana meron po nag-check kung maayos ko ba yung ramp, comfort rooms, elevators, or their adjustable desk. Then we need um, learning resources, mobility instructor, um, Filipino sign language courses, um, yun nga po, prayer room, gender sensitive classrooms, and uh, comfort rooms, and counseling and health services. Now, ito pong pang-anin na banggit po kanina, um, it is suggested po na sana magkaroon po ng separate bill on individualized education program. Ibang bansa po kasi nag, nagbugat yung terminology na IEP. So mas maganda po kung meron po tayong strong na policy that will require all people with disabilities na meron po silang program na customized lang po sa kung anong needs nila. Now, IEPs are developed by specialists, grupo po yan, needed by one learner, and is evaluated a year after its implementation. Yung pong sinabi ni um, Senator Pia kanina, it's really possible na after six months, um, nandun po siya sa special education center, and then probably because of the IEP, nalipat po siguro siya sa isang regular or nakita po yung kanyang galing. That is because of an IEP. Yung po yung nakikita po nating kulang sa ating mga bills. Sana nakafocus po tayo sa 
separate talks na policy on individualized education program, but we can um, use other terminologies if we want. So it also plays um, the learners with disabilities in the regular classroom para din po magkaroon sila ng employment after attending to special or regular school. IEP din po sa US, um, sa kanila po, 16 years old lang po, hindi na po sila um, nasa loob ng SPED center eh, or, or special education na school um, kasi meron na po silang employment. That is also part of their plan. So probably um, we can review more on that. Then, suggested po, lahat po ng um, Senate bills on inclusive education. We have 55, 69, 171, 329, 338, 345, and 540. Um, it should, maganda po sinabi, but it should be developed within a selected education institution in each region. So, meron po tayong hub, pero nasa loob po siya ng TI or each education institution. So, itong mga TI nito, marami po tayong um, normal schools sa buong Pilipinas. They will help develop policies and provide services to stakeholders of the schools and other institutions in their locality. Aside from those listed sa bills, idadagdag lang po that the resource, the resource center is recommended to have managers and specialists that will man the hub or the resource center. Meron po sanong provisions in developing inclusive um, instructional material. Meron po sanang help desk yung bigla pong magkaroon po ng problem. Meron po silang matatakbuhan within their locality. And it will also serve as a venue for IT meetings. Then, sa pong problema natin, of course, the diagnosis. Kung naalala po natin sa first hearing, um, meron po kasi tayong mga estudyante or may mga disability na nasa regular po sila kahit po sa SPED Center. Nahanan din po sila pero hindi naman po talaga alam kung ano po ang diagnosis nila. So therefore, may saan ang galing yung assessment. So if tatanungin po natin yung bilang ng tao na may disability sa Pilipinas, hindi po natin alam yon totally. It is because there are a lot of people na may disabilities, most especially learning disabilities, na nasa regular class. Ito po ay isa sa mga problema natin sa country natin. So we should provide resources for diagnosis. Um, the diagnosis could serve as a basis for educational placement. Kasi kung alam mo yung kanyang condition, therefore, alam natin kung saan natin siya lalagay. Anong, anong classing environment yung kailangan niya. Then it will be the first step in addressing the needs of learners with disabilities. That will also pave way to the segregated data of the PWDs in the country. Now, upon diagnosis, a, a strong policy on the development of educational plans or IEPs, of course, will follow. Kunti na lang po ito, ang DOH po pwede po natin matap. For number nine, we need to collect the segregated data to know ilan ba ang ating school na may disability. And then, um, first po natin ang training. So, the university, Philippine Normal University, suggests na sana mag-provide po tayo ng free tuition in service teachers. Ibig sabihin, nagtatrabaho na po sila as uh, sa teacher. However, pwede silang walang training on people with disabilities or handling people with disabilities. So, bakit hindi po tayo mag-provide ng free tuition to those teachers na gusto pong mag-aral pa in advance uh, for MA? I understand that there are um, several suggested training programs sa halos lahat po ng bills. Pero it is much better kung hindi lang po siya training program, kundi talagang kurso na po siya on how to handle cases in in the regular classroom or even in college. So once we give this, this will attract teachers to update their knowledge in teaching specifically in inclusive education. Then uh, MA, there should be an allocated MA unit na ang pangalan po ay special in inclusive education. Um, nakalagay po sa bills 55, 69, 171, 329, 338, 345, 40, and 804 yung pedagogies inclusive education kasama po dun yung universal design for learning or hindi natawag po natin UDL 
Ngayon, maganda po na nabanggit po yun sa mga Senate bills. However, saan nangyayari yung training on UDL? So, sinasuggest po ng university na uh, magkaroon po sila ng unit on inclusive education. So, doon po mag-discuss yun. Hindi lang po siya training program, kundi MA unit. Um, we, of course, have to designate one governing body in the education system. Ang trabaho po nito ay mag-marry ang ESDA, ang DepEd at CHED para po sa smooth na flow ng different na mga institutions. Halimbawa po, ang ESDA matatap for resource centers to provide training for uh, different learners. And for the last two na po, increase um, natin na ang ang monetary na allowance for remuneration of teachers, both regular and special ed teachers. Sa uh, pag-aaral po kasi, sabi po ni regular teachers, mas mataas po ang nakukuha ni ed teacher, pero nagahawak din po sila na people with disability. So, hindi lang po money ang pinag-uusapan dito, pero sana we have to give them smaller class size. Meron po silang teacher aid. Meron po silang shadow teachers. Meron po silang interpreters to help them facilitate their instruction. So, bigyan po natin sila ng, uh, ng assistance. And finally, um, sinabi po ito sa Senate Bill 69, um, yung tungkol sa child fine, maganda po ito. Pero idagdag po natin yung barangay officials. Sana po makasama po sila sa proseso ng paghahanap ng mga people with disability at saka placement din po kung saan po sila po. Maraming salamat. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Custodio. I have, um, may, meron akong, ano, no? meron akong uh, very fundamental question and this came out in a lot of the position papers na nakuha ako. And also, from the readings that I did, no, in in uh, readings from UNICEF, from other international institutions, when you say inclusive education, no, in simple terms, dapat lahat ng bata nag-aaral, uh, pinapaaral, regardless kung siya ay minority, siya ay children with disability, or siya ay gifted and talented. Tama po ba, uh, Dr. Custodio? Um, yes po. Tama po kayo, sir. So, Additionally po, um, ang UNESCO po, um, natawag po nila ang inclusive education as removal ng barriers para sa tatlong bagay. Kailangan po uh, walang barrier sa participation, sa presence, at saka sa achievement. Sa uh, Philippines po, Okay po tayo sa presence, eh. nandun po sila sa regular, nandun po sila sa special education. Um, okay din po tayo sa participation pero hindi po masyado. Uh, meron po kasi isa po sa mga pag-aaral. Um, nandun lang po yung estudyante na meron pong learning disability sa isang public school po sa NCR. Um, pero hinahayaan po siyang umopia ng teacher niya sa katabi niya. Ibig sabihin, nandun man siya, pero hindi naman natin matatawag na participation ito at saka achievement. Yung tatlong uh, bagay po yun, yung po yung batayan ng UNESCO 2017 to know is inclusive education. May presence po, participation, at saka po, achievement. Dr. Custodio, the bills actually focuses, majority of the bills, all 10 bills, majority of these bills or all 10 bills focuses on person uh, children with disabilities no yun ang kanilang main focus but when you say inclusive education we're also talking about minorities eh? correct and we're talking about kanina na mention yung ips uh, children in uh, conflict areas so uh, do you suggest that to make the bills holistic and encompassing do we include children minor children in minority groups children in conflict areas meaning do we legislate the policy of inclusive education opo para sa akin po pagkakataon na po ito eh na matawag natin yung Philippines is uh, truly inclusive however dun po sa sinabi ko kanina sa i guess number 3 sa definition 
um, gagawin po nating defined na inclusive education siya. However, ibigyan po natin ng highlight ang may disabilities kasi po si ang mga other groups po ay social and cultural ang needs nila. Pwedeng financial doon sa at risk, pero kapag po kasi disabilities, meron po itong learning needs. Kaya po sa tinawag din na LCNL, Learners and Special Education Needs. May learning needs po sila. But in our meeting po, I believe Dr. Post just is around. Um, pwede rin po naman na may separate po na policy on special education bills towards inclusive education. Pwede pong gawin na. So in other words, we legislate the policy of inclusive education to consider and also to uh, promote inclusive education um, for cultural minorities, for children in uh, conflict areas and others, but pay, pay, pay a lot of attention for children with disabilities because uh, they need more support and the requirements are more stringent. Is, is that what you suggest, Ho? Yes, Po. And the second suggestion, Po, is to create a separate na special education bill, Po, towards inclusive education naman, Po. So, pwede pong yung dalawa, Po. Pwede po kayong mag-decide. Ano po din sa dalawa. Mr. Chair, can I also ask? Yes, go ahead. On the, same, on, the same, yes. on the same question you had, Doctor, yes. what was the last thing you said? Na sabi mo yung isang suggestion yun is a separate bill on special, special. Is that, is that what you just said now? Special, special education po. Because um, if we are going to have a policy lang ng special education. Uh, magkakaroon tayo ng focus on disabilities alone. Kapag po disabilities lang, may isa pa pong issue dyan, isasama po ba natin yung gifted o disability lang? So, kailangan po talaga siguro ng separate na special education bill tapos meron pa po tayong inclusive education. Or it could be a broad na policy wherein pinadamay po natin lahat ng special. Okay. The reason I ask is because I do notice that I, I did note that you take time, no, to review the bill. And um, like in my bill, I'm only familiar with the bill that I filed. Uh, although it is inclusive education and it does um, also specify um, those that are culturally and um, culturally and uh, um, sorry, what is it? Geographically, what what is the other term here? Um, sorry, can you say that again? Um, we have um, cultural needs po at social needs po yung sa ibang group. Okay. So anyway, um, on that note, um, the bill, and I think the other bills also, have a lot of provisions on special education needs. So can you just maybe, Mr. Chair, we can ask them, sila naman yung expert, to look at them to see if there's really a need for a second and what are those provisions that we're looking for? Because in terms of output naman of the committee, ang objective that naman natin is prepared that ma-address natin, di ba? Whether it's one bill or separate bill, I think as long as ma-address natin yun, that, that's our objective. So if, if the inclusive bills do not, the bills on uh, inclusive education do not cover it, then either if they are just new provisions, like I said, my bill has provisions already and the others also, um, there's no need for a separate one. I understand your point totally. Na it's a since yung special ed kasi has special needs to be addressed. That's why may special provisions sila. Yung iba kasi are more on um e sector ready ba? So sector so, yung approach mo dun sa isa. But to me, they I still think that they can be addressed um in law. Kasi this is a law lang naman eh. This is very general. Obviously, the implementation will be in the details, which to me can be addressed naman by DepEd. It's asked me, ah. but of course, I need that up to the chair naman and the committee. I'm just saying that I, I um, as long as we address, um, that's, what, that's what matters to us. Thank you, Senator P. I, I think that's, all, that's also another point. Now, we do we have an overarching legislation on inclusive education and then in the same legislation give a lot of details to children with disabilities no because nasabi nyo nga kanina 
that uh, the requirements for children with disabilities are much stringent. No? So the overarching policy is inclusive education. And when you say inclusive education, kasama na dito minorities, uh, children in conflict areas, gifted and talented. Is that something that is uh, workable, Dr. Custodio? Because since we're, since we're talking about this law, um, I think it's much more efficient to have one law, one overarching law, with a, a, with a lot of focus on children with disabilities. Um, I believe so, Sir Chair. Um, I think this is already the chance to eh, provide tayo ng services to those na nasa minority group. And I believe pwede po na isang broad and then we target the need of um, different groups sa certain context na lang po. Um, meron po kasing ibang bills na nag-define po sila ng mga groups. However, pagkadating po dun sa mga services offered, mukhang pang disability lang siya. So, kailangan po natin i-klaro talaga. Dr. Custodio, during the last hearing, no, there was a um, some confusion on terminologies. No? For example, DepEd used children with special needs. No? Children and youth with special needs. And then uh, I, I, throughout, the, throughout the hearing, uh, children with, with special needs is also being referred to children with disabilities. But uh, I read also some literature that children with special needs may also refer to minorities. No? Uh, we may also refer to, let's say, um, uh, children with um, uh, religious sensitivities. No? So from your, from your expert opinion, what is the... Uh, to, not to, to create more confusion in the bill, no? How do we clear up what type of uh, the terminology is being used? Um, as mentioned po dun sa definition earlier, um, we define kung ano po yung groups at first. Eh, sabihin natin na uh, different groups. Hindi ko kasi matawag sir na special kasi po hindi po gusto ng ibang groups na term special. So, Pwede po may disability, gifted, may um, student at risk, then religious po. Yun po talaga yung magiging tawag sa kanila. Otherwise, pwede po natin gamitin yung special population. Ganun. At uh, Dr. Studio, meron ho. Uh, uh, we have some members... Uh, from the deaf community, um, although they just confirmed, because just a few hours ago, will will uh, 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 using ko lang ho yung ano no, uh, using ko lang yung uh, uh, situation. Okay, so um, uh, I, I know we have some uh, members of the deaf community. Uh, we will be typing the conversation uh, so that you can look at the chat group.
Sige. Um, yeah, we'll be uh, activating the chat group so um, uh, the uh, participants can look at the chat group also. So, Dr. Costudio, can you repeat again? Yung question ko kanina is terminology. Um, DepEd refers it to children with special needs. And then uh, the bills talk about children with disabilities. So, I, I know there there's uh, nuances in this. Can, can, anong, can you discuss the differences and what terminology we should use? Uh, um, with that, pwede po tayong gumamit ng broad na term, which is SWAN. SWAN refers to students with additional needs. Pwede pong ganun. And which, tsaka po natin ipibreak down kung sino-sino po yung mga nasa group. Um, one group would be um, uh, students with disabilities or learners po, para maging general, learners with disabilities. Then another group po would be gifted and talented learners. Uh, another group would be those with religious on uh, affiliation, uh, religious uh, affiliations, and then we have IP. Um, sa other bills po, say, sa dapat order din po, meron po siya hindi natawag naman na students at risk or in difficult circumstances. For example, yung pong nasa Marawi, example, yung pong um, nasa mababa po na socioeconomic path. So, pwede po tayong gumamit ng broad swan at could be applicable. So, tama po ba na ang children with special needs doesn't necessarily refer to children with disabilities? It's a much broader term. Um, there are terminologies po na mas ginagamit po yan sa may disabilities po talaga. Additional din po ang talented and learners. Kung tatanungin naman po yung minority, sila po yung hindi masyadong nababanggit dun sa term na, na special education needs or LSEM. Ganun po. But however, ano po kasi talaga, meron po tayong confusion talaga sa, sa definitions. Meron pong mga certain references na nagbabanggit naman po na lahat po ng mga taong nagbanggit ay kasama po dito. Kaya ang suggestion po ay sa policy, i-breakdown na lang po siguro natin yung definitions and then we provide services dun po sa bawat group na yun. Alright. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Custodio. We'll, we'll um, call on Dr. Bustos of uh, the University of the Philippines. Mr. Chair, can I just yes. pose a question that I'd like all the resource persons to address or also submit the recommendations? Yes, uh, um, Senator Pia. Yeah, so my question is basically this. Uh, with all the recommendations given, and of course a lot of it uh, will entail huge cost knowledge, we need more uh, special education teachers. Uh, there's a request, there's a recommendation for additional um, additional uh, allowances for teachers handling students with uh, special or additional needs, etc., etc. Uh, it takes money and it will take time. So my question for all the resource persons are, is this. What are the immediate interventions that we can do to already address the needs with the children with special or additional needs? So for example, if we can institutionalize or ask that ed institutional to, to issue a circular that um, will require parent assistance or we immediately tie up with um, TESDA to create these courses that would be like teacher's assistance. I want to know what are those immediate um, interventions that can be applied um, 
by the next school year, um, by two years. Para graduated, Mr. Chair, di ba? Hindi yung aantayin pa natin na mapasa natin yung bag ko, mag-graduate yung additional SPED teachers natin. Para every year, we are moving forward naman to giving these kids the education that they deserve. So I want I want sana ma-include yan sa lahat ng ano, at yung mga nagsalita natin, baka pwede na idagdag, di ba? Para maano natin kagal, ma-implement na natin. Thank you. Anyone? Si Therese, uh, si Therese Bustos po, sir. Yes, Dr. Dr. Bustos, do you want to respond yes. to uh, the query of um, Senator Pia? Uh, Dr. Therese, I cannot, we cannot hear you. We, we cannot hear you. Need you na po ako? Yeah, no, okay na. Okay na. Ho. Okay, salamat po. So I, so I will answer Senator Pia's question, but I just want to clear things out. When we came up with RA 10533, that's the K-12 law, we have already institutionalized inclusive education. So is there a need for a bill on inclusive education? In my opinion, there's no need for it. But there is a need to make sure that supports will be available to make it happen. And that is what needs to be done. So um, UP stance on this issue is that it has to be a bill focusing on disability. Simply because they are the group that needs the greatest help. Unfortunately, when we talk about inclusive education in very general terms, and I think we're not wrong in doing that, sometimes just by making the discussion on inclusive education to be so broad, we end up marginalizing them. And, and so, and that brings to fore the need for a bill that really focuses on disability inclusive education. But that doesn't mean that we can separate children with disabilities from those without disabilities. But that means that we will look for sports to make sure that if they can, they can be put together with children without disabilities, or if when they are not able to do that, that they will still receive quality education services in a separate setting. So to answer Senator Pia's question, is there something that we can do? The beautiful thing, and I'm sorry to, to use the word beautiful, the pandemic has forced the ITC issue. Uh, it has brought it to the fore. Because since children will be learning from remote, the individualized education plan becomes a very important document. Because that will tell people how to go about educating the child at home. In the past, schools, though I know DepEd has been trying to enforce this, schools did not take that up seriously. We've only heard serious inquiries about IEP making because of COVID. And for that, I'm quite thankful. What else can we do? The teacher assistant, having teacher assistant, assistant positions, teacher aid positions within the plantilla of Dep Ed will definitely help. Because right now, as far as I know, there is none. And in successful districts, in successful cities where there are teacher aides, teacher assistants, deaf teacher assistants, they were all supported not through central office funds or national funds, but they were supported by local government units. And so that is something that we can take a look at. Another issue is class size. For now, because of the remoteness, maybe it's not an issue. But when we go back to face-to-face -to -face classes, we need to take into consideration class size. And for schools that implement inclusive education, that maybe we can specify some parameters like 
limits on the number of children that will be in the care of that particular teacher. So those are my three suggestions. Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, Senator Pia. Just a very quick intervention. Um, as mentioned, uh, COVID has presented us with um, with opportunities that we need to take advantage of. No? I totally agree with that. And if, if the chair will recall, in your last week on um, uh, on the response on the response of DepEd uh, in this time of COVID, how they are uh, coping and making preparation. The chair will recall. Um, I, I mentioned, and the chair also started on his opening statement with, with that um, question. Um, what, 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 what is the downside of um, of uh, staying at home and, and having the children not have face to face um, classroom settings? No? And um, I posed the question, which I included in our comment to the president's report, that we continually be assessing the opportunity for small classroom sizes, especially in areas that are very um, that are negative for COVID or very very or that are confident safe. And again, this would I think this ties into the opportunity that Dr. Bustos is mentioning that. Um, uh, if if we if we open up that opportunity where say that that classroom size is normally forty five, but in this time of COVID, we will say that they only go to class once, uh, one week straight, three batches, so it becomes fifteen. So in other words, we need to take advantage of this bad situation, which is COVID, in a way try out that small classroom size. No? So instead of it be, being completely uh, learning from home, they have this one week and only 15 students to a teacher. So anyway, I know that was a separate hearing, but I'm tying it in because we need to learn from this time of COVID. No other opportunity for, for students, classrooms that have 30 to 45 students to experiment with 15. Nobody in their right mind will allow us to do that. Say na, one week mo lang papasukin yung mga anak. Hindi sila papaya. But in this time of COVID, now that opportunity is there, so DepEd is here, the experts are here. I just want them to wait in on those um, scenarios because we have no other time to do that. We are not going to build new classrooms overnight. We will have a population boom because of COVID. So the more magiging sikikan yung classrooms natin, we have less funding for, for building. So it's not going to happen on its own. We need to create that scenario, Mr. Chair. Yun lang po. Dr. Bustos, any any comment? Po? I agree. I agree that this is a good time to fix things in special education, in inclusive education. Because I think for the first time, we're looking at individualized education. Instead, because in the past, uh, it was like a cookie thing. Everybody, one size fits all. And so now, we know that that's not going to work. And... I, I think now is the best time to be talking about individualism. Dr. Bustos, I, you mentioned IEP, no? And uh, in our discussion uh, during the first hearing, it came out that IEP is such an important document. And I believe one of the resource persons even mentioned that, that in the States, it's a legal document. No? As to the extent of the legality, um, we have yet to discuss that, but uh, do you suggest to put a lot of emphasis in I, in the IEP in the law? And what do you want to see in the law uh, uh, when it comes to the IEP? Okay. So the IEP is a legal document, but it is a legal document that opens up doors for the child with disability, it opens up funding. It is the document that justifies government spending for the needs of that child. And so if we can formulate an IEP that is not just a guide for someone's education, but really a document that justifies why government should spend for the child, it's a document that identifies the needs of that child. For example, uh, like for the deaf, among us here in this meeting, 
must have needed an interpreter while they were growing up. And having that specified within that legal document would justify spending or having a budget to support that particular need. Other children will need therapy services, and that's specified also in the IEP. That also should be funded. And I think that's the major concern that most uh, persons with disabilities would have. Because while, you know, I know that it does its best to try to reach children with disabilities, we admit that there are still limitations and there are no funds to support those um, auxiliary services. And so I think having an IEP as a legal document, which now is the key to make sure that government supports children now because of that document, uh, would be a I think that would be a very good feature of whatever bill it is you will um, write. Thank you. Thank you, um, uh, Doc Bustos. And um, we also discussed about uh, during last time hearing no, the um, our teachers, no, because our, our goal in, 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 in most of the bill, no, the goal is to mainstream at one point. No? So the concept here, I'll put it in very simple terms. No? The intervention in the learning resource centers, but we also have, but the goal is to mainstream. No? And uh, in, in the first hearing, we also encountered that our teachers no, in the mainstream schools are not... Um, either not trained, not exposed, or inadequate yung kanilang knowledge when it comes to children with disability. So what do you suggest in order to improve on that in the short term and also improve on that in the long term? I, I think one of the first issues that would have to be addressed is class size. If we go back to face-to-face, -face, much of the apprehension of regular education teachers is managing huge class sizes with children with disabilities. And so that's one issue because we've seen teachers without training who have been able to handle children with disabilities because class sizes were manageable. So we have to take care of class size. DEPED is trying to take care of the in-service training. On the CHED side, we've been trying to take care of pre-service training, training teachers to prepare for setup. Um, also, I think in the last meeting, we were saying that maybe we should incentivize um, having inclusive classes. Not only do we take care of that size, but we incentivize teachers um, just to enable them to make uh, a house this. Because I know teachers are not really human motivated for all those benefits. But those benefits are our way also of recognizing the effort that goes into education of diverse learners. And so if we can take care of class size, if we can train them, and if we can incentivize having inclusive classrooms, then that might solve the problem. Thank you, thank you, uh, Doc. Um, well, over the years, no, I, I've seen the the class to student to classroom ratio has gone down tremendously, and uh, it's improving um, over the past few years. Except in urban centers, some urban centers still experience um, uh, high capacity uh, class sizes. But um, I, I think by 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 natural occurrence, we're looking at smaller class sizes, and I think that can now be a conducive environment to um, mainstream uh, more uh, children with disabilities without exerting pressure on the teachers. Because I acknowledge, and I also heard from the first hearing, that our teachers, are, are the pressures on them, no? because they have bigger class size, and then you have also um, children with disabilities that they need to Pay special attention to. 
that's why the the concept of uh, um, teaching or or co teacher skill. Uh, I think you also Bustos, can you expound on that? And is that something that we should put in the law as a incentive to teachers? I think first, if there can be positions made to have teacher assistants in the classroom, that would be great. If we can incentivize, and if we can have provisions within the bill that will incentivize um, having inclusive classes, that would be an added value. Yeah. And I think that would be welcome also, be welcomed by teachers who are practicing. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bustos. And uh, thank you for um, giving us your thoughts and your position paper. And uh, we'll, we'll come back to you in a, li in a little bit. I still want to uh, pick your uh, experience and knowledge on the subject matter. Uh, but we also want to hear uh, UNESCO, uh, who's here with us, represented by Mr. Rex Ubak and Ludwig. Kalambakal. Anyone from UNESCO who wants to uh, give us their thoughts? Mr. Rex or Mr. Ludwig? Are you there? And then who are you? Angela. Mr. Rex and Mr. Ludwig. Hello, sir. Yes, sir. Rex. Yes. Sir. Putul putul kay. Up. Uh, you're coming in very choppy. We cannot hear you. We cannot hear you. Kapakayayus na ni ko. Kapakayayus mo na yung connection mo. And then we'll get back to you. How about Mr. Ludwig? Hello, sir. Sir. I cannot hear you, uh, Rex. How about Mr. Ludwig? Yes. Yeah. Can you hear us? That is. Ba? Hello, sir. Mr. Ludwig. We'll get back to you na lang. Pakiayos po yung uh, inyong connection. Uh, we'll call on, call on first uh, Save the Children, who also submitted to us uh, a position paper. Ms. Sheremy Paraan and Attorney Emma Salmani. Hello. Yes. Hello. Yes, we can. Uh... Yes, naririnig ka namin. Go ahead. You can discuss your position. Hello. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Jeremy. Yes, um, can you hear me, Paul? Oh, uh, naririnig ka namin. Okay, good. Um, Mr. Chair, we also have a short presentation. So can we um, yes, share our content? Okay. Yes, go ahead. Let me just pull it up. Okay. Let's try it now. Kita na po ba, sir? Yes, kita na. Okay, sige po. So, uh, so on behalf of Save the Children CDP, uh, una po sa lahat, thank you po sa invitation na ito. We're happy to see uh, specific bill for learners with disabilities being moved forward, especially during this time. Uh, 
uh, it's very urgent and also very important for children with disabilities. So uh, to share our stand, po, allow me first to jump to the results of this rapid survey that see the children benefited with council groups for the welfare of children. So kami po ay bilang Shadrite Organization, bahagi po kami ng subcommittee on children with disabilities the function for the welfare of children. Ayan po. So, nilipat ko muna yung slide po. Ang um, uh, survey yeah, is you know, request na ano, parang mo naka-open na ano, na receiver. Baka may naka-open bakang ano. Uh, uh, Paki, we'll, we'll mute uh, dito sa control. Paka-mute okay. na lang. Uh, uh. Hello. And, uh, to everyone, please mute your microphones. Ayan, okay na po ba? Meron pa din po. So, hello. I'm trying without the earphones. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, sige. Ituloy ko yung mag-a-credit-pay. Ayan. So, nung May 48 po, nagkaroon ng rapid survey on the situation of children with disabilities in the context of COVID-19. So, this was primarily done through online. And this was routed, of course, by the member of the committee uh, within the CWC. So, ang lead, ang organization po, uh, managing the survey, actually, North Carolina, they see the children's ability to support uh, the conduct of this particular survey. So, uh, among participants, po, no, one week in the middle, uh, 4,006 po yung participants na si Magot dito po sa itong uh, survey na ito. So, ipapakita po namin yung highlights ngayon ng survey. Okay, una po sa naka-flash na screen ngayon, we ask, the respondent, so particularly children with disabilities, how did uh, quarantine measures brought about by the COVID-19 affected them? So ito po, kung makikita niyo po yung resulta, 48% are saying that they cannot access education services. It's the same po, the same thing goes uh, for very young children, whether they are enrolled in the child development centers, uh, daycare centers, and also supervised uh, neighborhood programs. Um, we attribute this po uh, to the fact that the previous school year was shortened by some weeks because of the onset of COVID-19. And um, also possibly they cannot go to the remediation centers anymore because we all know po, that this ed also offers uh, remediation classes even during the summer. So aside from um, unable to access education services, there's also loss of uh, income and employment among the parents and caregivers of children with disabilities and also having difficulty or uh, being able to access health clinic services and also rehabilitation services. Ayan po. Next po, no, uh, next major finding uh, that we found is on child protection. Among the respondents, almost 25% are saying that they are able to uh, witness that child abuse and domestic abuse is happening within the homes and within the immediate communities where the children with disabilities are. So they are saying that the most common form of abuse is actually verbal or emotional. And I uh, will also highlight po, no, in case the student, that we actually place this in the position paper to strengthen the protection component of the bill because children with disabilities are more prone po to abuse even back uh, in pre-COVID time. So going po sa National Baseline Study on Violence Against Children, kita na po doon sa 2016 study na talagang more prone to uh, protection uh, risks yung mga batang may disabilities. And, po. and then, now to the uh, next question, we asked about the issues or concerns that surface in the implementation of quarantine measures in the community in general. So, hindi na lang po ito nakapokus doon sa particular services, government services, that they should be availing. Ayan po. So, lumalabas yung mga sumagawa po on the survey, they have observed that there have been violations on physical distancing or social distancing. Uh, they are also affected by uh, the lack of availability of transportation. Again, uh, the effect of the quarantine is the capacity to earn. Wala pa rin pong testing kits uh, according to 40.9% of respondents. And then, lumabas na po doon yung... Um, 
uh, lack of access uh, of the parents to the education of learners with disabilities, and also disruption to in other basic social services. Yeah. And then uh, when asked about what we need like to uh, learn more about, so pinakamataas po doon yung specific protective measures for people with disability in general, no, not just children with disability, of course. And then second, uh, they want to learn more about the assistance provided by the government to persons and children with disability, and also the general protective measures for the general population. So yun po yung top three uh, that the respondents would like to know more about. Okay, so in a nutshell, if I will just summarize what I said, no, basically, po, the quarantine measures have exacerbated um, as part of the impact of COVID-19 on the current disadvantage that children with disabilities are already facing. They're having trouble accessing um, education services in different forms. So, and um, they're also an increase of protection risks as evidenced by the almost 25% of respondents saying that they're witnessing both child abuse and uh, domestic abuse. And lastly, uh, the respondents also would like to learn more about um, what are the programs and plans of the government for them at different levels. Ayun po. So, um, yun po siya. Pinapakita po namin ito. If you'd like to highlight uh, after the previous speakers have mentioned, it is an urgent legislation, very timely at the moment, and the current pandemic um, is even uh, causing more disadvantaged groups such as children with disabilities. So even more, um, so even more in, the in terms of their learning. Ayun po. So if you ask about the stand of single children, um, we'll go back to uh, first, uh, what group of children is already disadvantaged at the moment? How do we address this? We uh, second, um, mom studies explanation earlier, focusing uh, the bill on the life of children with disability. No, second, and so, um, we also value the voice of children and youth with disabilities. We would also like to highlight the fact that hopefully our lawmakers insert uh, provisions allowing for increased children's participation when it comes to matters that affect them, such as this one. And then, uh, and then, of course, uh, we also value support for teachers no? as a specific recommendation of children with disabilities themselves. They're saying that they understand that it's very difficult to teach them or teach their peers as well. So they're even mentioning moral support for teachers. Ayan po. And then, through uh, peace and mobility, kagaya po yung nabanggit ko na sa dati nito, uh, for instance, yung mga bata na deaf or hard of hearing, accidentally na tatamaan nila yung mga kasi nila. Hindi, hindi nila sinasadya sa limited space. Ngayon po na distance learning, ang um, usapin po ng space and mobility would be having a, a sufficient assistive device that would help them learn and understand their teachers even in such a small space, kung ganun pa yung meron sa kanilang mga bahay. And then, fourth suggestion po from children uh, with disabilities is having extra learning time with teachers and with peers because it's also help their learning. And lastly, um, they appreciate the support being provided by the deaf ed teachers, you know, but they'd also like to see uh, support from the LGUs and these different sectors working together to fulfill education, deliver education for them. Ayun po. So, the top presentation ko na po, Mr. Chair, and then not yet, we'd like to um, highlight that uh, we should be continuing our support for children with disabilities so that they can continue their education even during this um, period. Salamat po. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Actually, I was going to raise this uh, issue with DepEd uh, regarding the um, plan for children. We wanted to uh, uh, ask DepEd a situationer of our in line of COVID. But I'll ask them later on. I, what I want to ask uh, Save the Children is what you it's it's thank you very much for bringing this up um 
not only it's timely, but it's also important to um, bring this to the fore. Uh, what do you suggest that we should include uh, in light of the definitely challenging no? implement education uh, in the light of the pandemic, more so to implement education to children with disabilities, they require other facilities and other expertise. So, sa ganitong nangyari, no, I, I conducted the survey na malaki, ah, 50,000. Um, what do you suggest we should include in the bill that um, education becomes more inclusive uh, even in uh, the pandemic? Okay, yeah, yes, Mr. Chair. Opo. Um, with us, let's comment that end. We have the basic education learning continuity plan already, and we know there's an annex to be um, hopefully soon. It focuses on the needs of children with disabilities. So, um, part of uh, the civil society organization, we'd like to know more about that so we can also support the operationalization of the LCP in particular. When it comes to the concrete measures, uh, provisions that we can include in the bill, perhaps we can look into maximizing para teachers, um, community volunteers, community facilitators, bridge the gap between schools and homes. Especially during this period po, no, when children are largely expected to learn in the home settings. I'm not um, that familiar with the project that the Department of Education clearly have at the moment or whether there is um, a, a, an allocation that can be uh, given to community volunteers. But hopefully, we this time that we really saw what does an um, integrated multi-sectional approach look like, or what does um, um, different government agencies at the national and local community level would look like, and that would mean um, but block barangay institutions or even LGUs at the higher levels, mostly working together with that at the principal levels as well, so we can really operationalize the plan for the condition of a particular community and particular schools. So, um, yun po yung isa na tradition that we're um, pushing for, specifically for different government agencies and schoolers to actually work together and operationalize this. We'd also like to flag to the low to um, give appropriate budget as well, because as you all know here, even in the previous meetings, for uh, children with disabilities need assistive devices as well for them to be able to communicate with their teachers, even with their parents and uh, peers as well. Para makasabay pa rin sila dun sa mga lessons na uh, be ibibigay this coming school year. So um, those are the two major things that we recommend at the moment and as uh, civil children Philippines is also part of a larger education uh, network uh, it's like inet philippines also supporting the advocacy that they would put forward um jeremy um i can see uh, unesco is already online uh, rex Rex of UNESCO. Yes, sir. Apo. Ayan, mas malinaw ka na. Sige. Yes, sir. Narihihin na po ba ako, sir? Yes, yes. Go ahead. Apo, sir. Narihihin na po. Sir, uh, napakaganda po ng mga naibanggit ni Dr. Bustos ano, at ng ating kasimula sa Philippine Normal University. Ngunit po, ano, uh, naibanggit ko kanina yung mga factors na kailangan po to ensure inclusive education based po sa konteksto at pamantayan na inirekomenda ng UNESCO. Number one po, ano, is no barriers, complete participation presence. Doon po, ano, barriers po, ano, ang kakawaran po ng edukasyon ay napakaraming programa na pong naipapatupad upang matugunan itong suliran ninyo sa no barriers issues. Unit participation, when we have consultation among National Commission in the Asia-Pacific, there were two school of thoughts that uh, came to surface. Number one, gagawin nyo po ba ang inyong inclusive education para doon sa may mga uh, estudyante may special needs as a separate 
uh, as a separate program or kasabay sila doon sa mga normal students natin. Now, uh, of course, doon kung isa-separate ang classroom natin, ano, for example, para sa mga taong sinasabi po natin na naibanggit po natin, sir, na with special needs, yun po ay tinatawag nating context-based or needs-based education. Uh, sa una pong, ano, sa una pong naibanggit po, ano, kung isa-separate po natin, yan po ay maka, uh, would require trainings for our teachers to have competency and skills to teach both students with disability and those students with no disabilities. Pangalawa po ano, doon po sa pangalawang uh, option na ibinanggit ano, na kung isa-separate po, yun po naman sir, ay magkakaroon naman, ang mga, magkakaroon naman po tayo ng problema that these students under the special education would be further disenfranchised. Dahil nga po, ang iniiwasan po natin, ano, yung konteksto po ng inclusive education is for them not to be further marginalized. <clears throat> yun po sir, ano. Ngayon po sir, ito pong Global Education Monitoring Report po sir, na inilabas noong June 23 ng UNESCO po. Yun po ay uh, calls on the member states to have a clear policy definition of what is inclusive education. Kaya nga po na uh, we, uh, kami po ay uh, nag-aagdi po doon sa kasamahan natin sa Philippine Normal University to have a more policy defined, uh, a clear policy definition of what inclusive education is. So that mas matugunan natin, sir, anong po ba ang ating ibig sabihin ng inclusive education? Ito po ba ay tumutukoy lamang doon sa mga uh, persons with disabilities o doon doon sa mga taong nasa marginalized sector ng ating uh, komunidad tulad ng indigenous people, yung pong nasa loob ng tihitan o kulungan. So yun po sir ay isa sa mga bagay na dapat nating tukuyin para po mas magkaroon tayo ng mas klarong definition ng inclusive education. Salamat po. But from from uh, UNESCO literature, no edit. Uh, but from your standpoint, Mr. Rex, ano ang yes, recommendation sir. mo? Anong recommendation ng uh, UNESCO was, no? Uh, um, with the with this bill, no? Uh, how suggest? Oh. The definition um, the objective. That is, sir, ano, yan po ang pangunahing uh, recommendation, sir, ng UNESCO. Ano, base po ito sa Global Education Monitoring Report is to have a clear policy definition of what inclusive education is. Dahil po, kung mas magsisimula po tayo sa mas klarong definition kung ano ang tinatawag nating inclusive education, atin na pong ma-enumerate kung ano-ano o sino-sino yung mga dapat nakakasama doon sa inclusive education. And that is very significant because that would uh, give us an idea of how much funding do we really have to give para doon sa mga education sectors that provide support or educational support for inclusive education. Pangalawa po ano is to capacitate our teachers doon sa pag-handle uh, po ng mga uh, students with disabilities. And not only that, sir, ano, may mga programa naman po actually ang Department of Education. Let's say, for example, sir, sa kanilang alternative learning system, meron na po doon mga programa para sa kanilang indigenous people, mga tao po ano, na nasa loob ng pihitan o, o in far-flung areas. In fact, meron po tawag tayong multi-grade uh, education system na kung saan po ano, dahil po sa kakulangan ng uh, facilities, may mga pamamaraan ang kagawaran ng edukasyon na kung saan multi-grade po nasa isang classroom para lang po maikater lahat ng pangailangan ng isang komunidad na hindi kumpleto ang mga facilities in terms of education. What is UNESCO's definition of inclusive education? Sir? What is UNESCO's definition, policy definition of education? Rex? Rex? Rex, can you hear me? Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll go to, uh, we'll go back uh, later on. Um, we want to call on uh, ENET Philippines.
si uh, Ma'am Mercy Chan. And you've also sent us, Ma'am Mercy, an extensive uh, position paper. Thank you very much for that. Um, I, I want you to discuss your position paper so that we can uh, have a, a, a good engagement on the contents of your recommendation. Um, yes, um, good afternoon. Um, can you hear me well? Yes, yes, you're coming in very loud and clear. Uh, yes, but thank you. Um, yes, we submitted position paper. These are um, consolidated comments and recommendations on all the bills filed on inclusive education for um, um, children with special educational needs. And we, we also submitted a draft uh, bill wherein we consolidated uh, the good uh, provisions of all the bills filed, and we've also integrated our proposals. Um, let me share with you a um, um, short a brief PowerPoint on our um, uh, position. Head, ma'am, uh, mercy. Malino po. Um, can you see it now, Po? Uh, lumalabas na siya. Ayan, we can see it already. Okay, thank you, Po. Um, sige po, simulan ko lang ano, sa pagbibigay ng ilang uh, data kaugnay ng um, situation of our learners with disabilities uh, regarding education. Um, children and youth with disabilities remain one of the most marginalized groups in education. Uh, this is despite for the fact that um, we have started establishing SPED centers since the 1970s and we have adopted inclusive education framework since the 90s. Uh, pero until now, they are uh, they remain marginalized. So I guess ito agad ang uh, dahilan why we are pushing for a passage of a law uh, to institutionalize education for learners with disabilities. Um, in 2018, Philip estimates that one out of seven, or around 5.1 million uh, Filipino children are living with disabilities. So ito po ang pinaka uh, data that we got. Uh, but enrollment data from the Department of Education in school year 2016-2017 ay nagsasabi na ang enrollment lamang ng learners with disabilities ay nasa 304,604. So, uh, lumalabas po na um, wala pa sa 10% no, yung um, um, participation ng learners with disabilities natin sa ating education system. Uh, DepEd data for school year 2017-2018 showed there are only 676 PED centers um, throughout the country. And these are 446 uh, PED centers and 230 schools with SPED programs. Uh, uh, with 2,885 teachers for special education. Um, this, uh, if we can compare this to so overall data of our learners, we have 47,000 public schools overall. And uh, we have 800,000 teacher, public school teachers overall. Uh, but this is the data we got for um, um, special education. Disability-specific appropriation for children with disabilities is estimated to be at only 0.44% um, of the debt and budget. At uh, yun po, pawala-wala pa from time to time yung, yung allot, allotment specifically for spend. Okay, um, we have uh, tried to consolidate po yung, um, yung study namin for all the bills filed, and we have come up with the comments and recommendations uh, on all the bills filed. Uh, this is um, in a, working closely with the disability sector under the Coalition for Education of Learners with Disabilities. Now, uh, this is only a five-point uh, five point, um, uh, set of comments and recommendations. Number one, we recommend that the term children and youth with special needs be changed to learners with disabilities. Learners with disabilities must be clearly identified as a target group as they are the primary focus of the bills. Considering disability as special needs might lead to classifying as special rights what are actually human rights, civil rights, or disability rights? So, medyo outdated na po yung paggamit ng term na special or special needs um, sa kasalukuyang uh, ginagamit natin na rights-based approach uh, to the education of learners with disabilities. 
Special needs also imply segregation, which is in contrast to the inclusive and accessible education being promoted by the bills. Um, gifted and talented should be addressed separately as they have entirely different needs. Um, our number two point, to further strengthen the bills, focus on the education of learners with disabilities, we recommend the adoption of the following definition of inclusive education used in SB 329 that was filed by Senator Angara. So we believe po, um, pag-aaral namin sa mga bills filed, the definition provided by Senator Angara's bill ang uh, most appropriate uh, in the context of providing education for learners with disabilities and defining inclusive education in that context. So inclusive education means providing to all students, including those with significant disabilities, equitable opportunities to receive educational services with the needed supplementary aids and support services in each appropriate classrooms in their neighborhood schools in order to prepare students' lives as school members of society. It requires that schools educate children and youth with special needs predominantly in general education classrooms. Removal of children and youth with special needs from the regular educational environment that special class or separate schooling occurs only in education in regular classes. Are with the or with the use of supplementary aids and services cannot be made satisfactorily. Um, okay. Number three, we strongly support the bill's objective to provide free and appropriate public education and related services to learners with disabilities. We recommend an explicit definition of term related services. Um, the term related services means transportation and various de developmental, corrective, and other support services, um, like speech language pathology, audiology services, interpreting services, intervener services, psychological services, physical and occupational therapy, recreation, social work services, school health services, counseling and rehabilitation services, orientation and mobility services, and medical services, as may be required to assist a child with a disability to benefit from education and include also early identification and assessment of disabling conditions. Fourth, we recommend an additional provision on procedural procedural safeguards um, so that um, learners with disabilities and their parents are guaranteed procedural safeguards with respect to the provision of free and appropriate public education. So this for includes um, opportunity of uh, parents to participate in meetings with respect to identification, evaluation, and educational placements of their children, opportunity for me uh, mediation to resolve disputes uh, prior to filing complaints, and opportunity to um, present a complaint. Um, children are uh, rejected by um, regular schools. And fifth, we recommend that establishment of resource centers be in every district instead of division. Uh, present people, um, there are 221 total deaf ed divisions. Um, so, siyempre po, hindi naman siguro lahat ng division meron ng um, um, SPED or resource centers, but um, masyado po malaki yung um, coverage ng division na isang buong probinsya o isang buong sudad para magkaroon lamang tayo ng isang resource center sa kada division. So, we recommend that it, it be established in every district instead of division. The Resource Center for Learners with Disabilities shall function to assist in promoting inclusive education and incapacitating regular schools to effectively handle the needs of learners with disabilities. Lalo na po ngayong panahon ng COVID, no? nakikita po natin na, namin na um, resource centers could very well provide the avenue for the blended learning para po sa ating mga learners with disabilities. In fact, we have also uh, submitted a proposal to them to start establishing the, the at least piloting uh, other resource centers uh, amid this COVID time. Alam po matiyak na hindi natin mapag-iwanan talaga ang ating mga learners. Um, 
So ito po muna, um, again, um, we have submitted to you a draft bill um, consolidating the good provisions of the bills filed and also integrating all of the five um, recommendations that we presented. Uh, Maraming salamat po. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and the done research on all the bills. Uh, I just have a few questions. So number one, guards. Uh, well, uh, uh, more on the procedure of safeguards. On the provisional safeguards. Um, um, Senator, I have a question that I have with me during the meeting. Representatives from... Um, uh, the disabilities who are, who are also leaders of the Philippine Coalition of the UNCRPG. Um, gusto ko pong i-refer sa kanila, uh, maybe Bong, Sir Bong Garcia, Adarko Garcia can uh, very well explain um, provision on procedural safeguards, if you may. Uh, okay. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, because that's a, wala yan sa mga Senate bills eh. Yung procedural safeguards. That's why I want to, uh, someone to uh, explain please mr garcia go ahead Sige po, go ahead mr garcia Oh, okay. Mr. Garcia? Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, just a few remarks so before going into procedural safeguards. Uh, as mentioned by Senator Cayetano, uh, during her time as chairman of the Education Committee, Similar bills have already been heard by the Senate. And uh, this came from different DPO groups, particularly the Advisory Council of the DepEd on the Education of Children with Disabilities. Gumawa ho ng plan ang Advisory Council at binigay yon kay Senator Cayetano para magawa ng appropriate bill. At that time, when this... Uh, plan was submitted, the term inclusive education referred only to education of children with disabilities. However, ho, during the past two years, the term inclusive education has been co-opted by other groups, uh, especially, especially um, the, the UN. The UN inclusive education refers to all. Kaya, for some reason, this group napasa yung bill at that time. Noong 17th Congress, the chairman, si Senator Escudero, hindi eh, nung nakalusot yung bill, sinibig na nag-comment sama ang provisions sa mga ID. Mr. Garcia, problema ho ng PPT, ay paano is... Mr. Garcia, sandali lang po. Paki... Paki-mute po yung mga isakta. Yan. So, sandali po ah. Na, ah. Okay, so sige po, Mr. Garcia, go ahead. Nung pistumpo yung bill na ito, nung pang-16 Congress, uh, ito ay dahil sa trabaho ng maraming PTOs, parang yung advisory council sa DEPET, nagumuha ng strategic plan 
para sa education ng mga children with disabilities. At binigay ho ito, Senator Cayetano, para ma-convert into a bill, magkiroon ng exclusive bill for the education of children with disabilities. Uh, ang, nung panahon ko yun, ang term inclusive education referred only to education of children with disabilities. However, the term has been co-opted by other groups, particularly since the United Nations started using the term to include all learners, so naging, uh, including all learners, particularly all marginalized learners. Kaya na broaden yung concept ng inclusive education. Okay. Uh, Noon hong 17th Congress, hindi rin mo ito natapos ng committee ni Senator Escudero dahil may may mga grupo na gusto isingit yung mga pangangailangan ng mga ibang grupo like Madrasa and IP. Ang naging problema ho ng committee is uh, dadami yung funding requirement ng bill at hindi na alam kung paano i-estimate kung i-expand yung coverage ng bill. Yung main issue nga ho siguro ng mga bills nito is define the coverage of the proposed bills, whether it should be limited only to children with disabilities or to include all other children, uh, including all other marginalized children. Sa lower house, so, yung issue din ho yung ganitong issue. At ang, if I may volunteer this, so, ang naging decision ho ng lower house is to limit the, bill to the education of children with disabilities Pero sinama to, to nila, education for learners with disabilities in support of inclusive education. Yun ang ginawang term sa lower house. Ang ibig sabihin nun natin kasi sa inclusive education when it refers to children with disabilities is that they are educated as much as possible together with non-disabled peers in regular classrooms and they are taken out only when it is required by their disability to be given additional training and additional courses. So yun yung naging basic definition ng inclusive and dapat kasama kayo sa loob ng classroom, which is in contrast to the existing system of training students in SPED centers. Pag nasa SPED center, yung kasi yung bata, naka-isolate siya, naka-segregate, and the disability sector considers this system as discriminatory to children with disabilities. Kaya kung pinupromote, dapat inclusive, dapat maturuan yan kasama yung mga walang kapansanan. When you look at the statistics of children with disabilities, about 80% have minor disabilities at ito moderate disabilities at walang masyadong problema ang isama mo sa mga regular classroom. Only the remaining 20% or so have severe disabilities that they may require special training and special classes to be done outside the regular classrooms. Kaya nga ho yung position namin ngayon, ngayon, 8th Congress, uh, sabi natin, i-limit natin, i-define natin yung scope ng bill to learners with disabilities. Dahil yung inclusive ito, nag-iba na yung meaning, pati ho yung term na special needs, nag-iba na rin. It, it's a... Uh, it's now being used to cover all marginalized children and not only children with disabilities. Okay. Uh, gusto ko lang humidagdag sana na in the times of COVID, kasi may mga nag-comment kanina na ngayong may COVID situation, siguro ho, hindi may dagdag din sa mga bill. Yung COVID do kasi it highlighted the role of parents in educating their children. Ang mga bill, so while there are mentioned, uh, the role of parents, baka kailangan ng more explicit provision to specify the assistance and support that parents have to get from government so that they can continue the role of teaching their children in their homes rather than in schools. Okay. Ang isa pa ho sigurong pwedeng idagdag sa mga bills is a provision on flexibility of modes of learning. Sa Amerika ho kasi may mga ibang skwela that are opting to stop schooling, or not to start schooling, because they cannot provide education to children with disabilities under the law of the U.S. IDEA. These have to be taught in inclusive settings. So sinabi ho ng Secretary of Education, uh, we're giving you the flexibility to do distance learning for all children, including children with disabilities. Yun yung DepEd natin, uh, ginawa na ho yun at sabi ng nila, gumawa tayo ng IEP para sa bawat estudyante. 
yung IEPU pa si teaching and yaces kung ano na bang status ang education level ng bata, anong kailangang ibigay, anong kailangang assistive devices, anong kailangang support ang ibigay. At yun ay pag-aagrihan ng eskwela, ng teacher at ng magulang. Kaya ho nabanggit kanina, it becomes a legal document, it becomes a contract between the school and the parents and the child. Uh, kaya ho, hindi natutupad yung IEP. Hindi mo papasok yung tinatawag namin procedural safeguards. So gagawa tayong maraming provision, ganito ang gusto natin mangyari. Pero kung hindi naman humapatutupad ang mga provisions na yun, saan pupunta ang magulang? Saan siya magdadala ng complaint? Yun ang sinasabi namin procedural safeguards. Kung mong dapat sa DepEd, at kung hindi, matang, hindi, niya, uh, hindi siya agreeable kung anong sinasabi ng DepEd, then we create a body that will resolve or mediate yung conflict or dispute between the parents and the child and the school. Normally, this is, is a body that is housed within DepEd, pero preferably huturo under the jurisdiction of the DOJ or the OST, together with the uh, trained uh, mediators and trained arbitrators and together with the representatives of DepEd to, this, to resolve any dispute that may arise in the non-implementation of the IEP for each child that will be agreed uh, before the start of the school year. Uh, yun lamang, lang muna po at this time. Uh, maraming salamat. So, thank you, thank you, Mr. Garcia. But uh, hindi ba nasa jurisdiction na yan ng DepEd? Since this is education and we're talking about institutions that are under this provision of DepEd, hindi ba dapat uh, uh, parte na yan ng administrative powers ng DepEd? Yun yung first level complaint siguro, i-discuss sa DepEd. Ang nabanggit ko nga, kung hindi ma-resolve within DepEd, then perhaps people have to go to a body independent of DepEd. Kasi yung complaint ho mangyayari, complaint against DepEd eh, for non-implementing the agreed IEP for its child. So kung DepEd din ho ang mag-resolve, baka magkakaroon ng uh, parang lack of independence. Okay, nakuha ko na yung concept. Although we have to ask DepEd their, uh, their opinion on that because uh, it might be redundant. Uh, DepEd is already doing it. No? Um, creating another body might also become uh, superfluous. No? But uh, everyone will ask uh, DepEd their opinion on that. Um, and then we also have um, uh, people from ECCD, si Dr. Teresita de Mesa and Maika del Mundo. Any one of you who wants to uh, uh, explain their um, position paper? Uh, good afternoon, po, Mr. Chair. I guess I will... Um, be the one to share the content of our position paper. Uh, from our last um, hearing po in January, we emphasized the importance of early intervention that even children who are not yet in um, the DepEd schools are at risk for uh, disability and may have some developmental delays and early intervention would be crucial to uh, provide an inclusive early learning experience for these young children. So that is um, one main point of the position paper of the CCD Council is that we, we do support the um, inclusive education and special education acts through these Senate bills. Um, but we would also like for these bills to include our young learners from zero to four uh, so that we can also minimize um, later interventions in when children 
with disabilities go to school. So as early as their um, pre-kindergarten years, that they should also receive um, the necessary intervention or accommodations even in their child development centers. We also want to emphasize that the use of the early childhood care and development checklist should be maximized in terms of um, providing assessment for our young children, uh, young learners in the pre a um, level, so zero to four. Since there are appropriate uh, checklists to use, this would serve as a good screening tool po to determine whether children um, have are on track with their development. So in some areas, they have no access to uh, developmental pediatrician, so they don't have a means to be diagnosed. But through the use of the early childhood care and development checklist, which is also used in the kindergarten level, at least our ECC service providers um, have an idea of what skills need to be addressed uh, among these children. Um, one reality that we face in the child development centers is that when children with disabilities try to enroll in their nearest step in school, the, the receiving teacher from the deaf ed school would say for the child to go back to the child development center because of the disability. Or they would say, oh, these skills have not yet been developed in this child, so they have to go back to the child development center. Where in fact, the child is already beyond the age limit that is supposed to be um, for the child for admission to the child development centers. So if we include um, ways in which LGUs can also be supported in providing inclusive uh, education to the young learners, it would also help later on for those who are going to the deaf ed schools. Uh, we also mentioned in our position paper that for areas that have um, difficulty in accessing uh, center-based programs, we could probably include in the bills ways by which LGUs can provide home-based programs or community-based rehabilitation programs for children who need them. Um, so yun po yung mga main points namin, including the need to provide the necessary appropriations for these suggestions po. So we, we acknowledge and we, we really support that such, such bills are uh, being considered, um, but we also would like to uh, input these particular um, concerns. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Maika. We, we, uh, it's a good idea to include um, early childhood uh, in the bill, uh, especially daycare centers. Um, I think uh, early intervention in that realm is uh, very important you know, because uh, early detection can correct many, many things. Eh? So uh, we do agree that we can include that in the bill. Pahingi na lang ng suggestion sa inyo, so we can uh, include that. Um, and also, what type of uh, early intervention that we can give uh, in that age range? In sinabi mong zero to four years old. Although what we can hit is actually the three or four years old because yun yung mga daycare age. Eh. Bumaba ng four ang daycare age. Eh. Um, we have national child development centers, Mr. Chair, that also offer programs for infants and toddlers. So there are some uh, disabilities po kasi that have uh, telltale signs earlier on. Po, while there are some disabilities also that can only be confirmed uh, later on. But whatever developmental delay they present during these years can be addressed po through uh, capacitating our child development workers and also providing um, 
professionals or at least transfer of technology for auxiliary services for these children in the LGZ. Uh, medyo scarce din po kasi yung kunari po yung nangangailangan ng speech therapist or physical therapist or occupational therapist. Um, in, lalo na po sa mga malalayong lugar. Pero meron din pong tinatawag na community-based rehabilitation programs. I think UP Camp has a, such a program po. So they also train and capacity members of the LG, whether it's in your BHW or your BNS and child development work, so that they are somehow equipped with the skills to provide at least minimal interventions for these children. In labs. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're also joined by the SWD. Uh, is Marimel Laksa. Meron ka yung comment on the bill? Yes, good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Paper. Uh -oh, you can discuss your position paper on the bill because the daycare is actually under the SWD. No? So, um, and the suggestion to CCD is to include children from zero to four, four being in our daycare centers, which I agree. Yes, no? yes, um, we have to have some form of uh, intervention and detection at the daycare centers. Yes. So we're looking for suggestion from both ECCD and DSWD. So kung meron kayong suggestion, you can uh, elaborate that uh, now. Actually, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, as far as member of the ECCD Council and po, the DSWD, um, Ms. Mike can confirm, yun nga po, we already developed the system for the early identification, prevention, and intervention of disability among our children in the child development centers or the daycare centers. Kasi nga po, as you mentioned earlier, mas maganda at an early age talagang nadidetect na rin po natin if a specific child has disability. Kasi po, mas challenging po kasi talaga ang management ng mga children with disability in our daycare centers or child development centers. However, alam din po natin yung limitation ng ating mga child development workers that not all of them probably wala man pong 10% siguro ang talagang trained or capacitated to really manage children with disabilities in daycare centers. And we all know po that the daycare centers or the child development centers, yan po ang pinakamalapit na institution na nandoon lang sa ating mga barangay that our children with disability could really access ano po but unfortunately yun nga po kung hindi rin ganun ka manageable or hindi rin ka capacitated ang ating child development workers to manage them baka po hindi lang din sila matulungan di po ba ko baga ang mangyayari double job party kaya nga po we are really asking the assistance of the senate the congress ano po and particularly our local government units to really invest in uh, capacitating our child development workers to manage children with disabilities in our daycare centers para po pagdating nila sa elementary hindi na rin po ganun sila maihirapan uh, doon sa tinatawag nating inclusion nila doon sa regular school. So what do you want to see in the law? Um uh, is uh, laksa anong anong gusto niyo makita sa ito sa batas na ito? Um yun po maliban po doon sa dapat yung ating mga child development workers ang uh, trained in managing children with disabilities. Uh, please allow me po to share with you some of the general comments. Uh, of the DSWD in our position paper, which we submitted on March 2, 2020, to the committee. So, yung mga details po nito, hindi ko na po sasabihin. General comments, alam po, Mr. Chair, if yes, you would allow. Yes. Uh, so, the proposed uh, consolidated uh, bill sana should seek to mainstream the rights of our children and youth with special needs or disability to address problems of inclusivity, discrimination, and lack of opportunity of these children and youth with disabilities. And then the definition of scope, as mentioned then for earlier, dapat um, klaro din po yun. And aside from the relevant laws and international conventions, the committee may look into the existing frameworks and strategies that could be used as reference to develop a universal framework 
for inclusive education in the Philippines, such as the Sustainable Development Goals, the Philippine Development Plan, the Asian Enabling Master Plan, the DepEd Inclusive Education Framework, and the National Early Learning Framework, which was uh, developed by the ECCD Council. And then consider also the integration of the Filipino Sign Language uh, in grade school curriculum to allow non-SPED students to understand and be sensitive to the condition of their hearing impaired peers. We also suggest, Mr. Chair, to use the term disability or impairment instead of handicap and mental retardation in consideration of the Inchon strategy to make the right real for persons with disabilities in Asia and the Pacific. And uh, we recommend to also include the non-handicapping environment for persons with disabilities, which is currently implemented by the National Council on Disability Affairs. This project, for just a brief background, aims to put together available resources in the community and improve people's attitudes to ensure inclusion of persons with disability in all levels of community activities, particularly for the children and youth with special needs education through this project. And then lastly, we recommend that to ensure attaining inclusive education, there should be a provision in the consolidated bill on the regular programs and activities of children and youth with special needs together with those children that do not have disability. This will help the children and youth with special needs or disability be exposed and develop their abilities to their full potential towards their self-sufficiency and become effective partners in building our country. Furthermore, this will teach the children without special needs or disability to accept, embrace, treat, and help children and youth with disabilities as children like them who deserve love and acceptance by the people around them. So yun po ang general uh, comments namin, which is in our position paper, Mr. Chair. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Thank you, Paul. Sa mga daycare centers natin, ano, I, I want to ask you because and daycare is uh, under the SWD, correct? Uh, uh, monitoring lang po, uh, Mr. Chair, but it's yeah. directly it's under, under the LGU. Po. Correct. It's under LGU, but it's uh, the monitoring and policy is uh, jointly uh, being promulgated by the SWD and the local. Yes, Paul. Uh, Yung, um, any recent policy on the, on on diagnosis, early detection, uh, meron ba kayong recent uh, policy on those things? Because I really believe that uh, as early as we can, no, and and the daycare being a organized um, organized uh, unit, uh, we can use that for early detection. Meron bang mga policies rinibas ang DSWD to that effect? Actually po, even way back, 2000, year 2000 po yan, or earlier po, uh, Mr. Chair, meron na po tayong uh, DSWD policy po dyan on the early detection of disability in our daycare centers. Ano po, na na-revive lang po with our ECCD Council yun nga pong uh, system on the early detection and prevention of disability. So meron na po tayong policy na. Ayong statistics, like for example, uh... Uh, based on yung sinabi kanina ni Maika, yung checklist, no? I, 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 that is the one you were referring to. Meron ba tayong statistics? For example, ilan ang ilang students ang uh, na-survey ninyo through this checklist? Ano yung kanilang mga disability? Ano yung intervention? Do you have those uh, statistics? Because again, no? Tama ka eh. You're, you're absolutely correct that the daycare is the nearest learning institution to the barangays our communities uh, and that is a a that is a potential for early detection so do you have any statistics together with eccd on on this matter uh, actually uh, mr chair we have the eccd information system which is uh, being managed by the SWD. And uh, yes, po, we could uh, extract the data on children with disability who are in the daycare doon po sa ating information system. Uh, uh, provide naman sa amin, no? Because uh, I, I want to know, 
uh, for the last five years using your checklist and your early detection. I would, I would call this early detection. No, yung sinabi Apa. ni Anina. Apa. Uh, give us your statistics on the last five years. Sige po, Mr. Chair. Sa survey ninyo, ano yung mga na-detect ninyo. And uh, gusto ko ibangga to sa DepEd no? because we had some issues on statistics last time. Because under the DepEd uh, um, statistics, ang ating children with disabilities about 231,000. No? Mm -hmm. Yes, 5.1 million. Huge, huge discrepancy no? uh, on how many children with disability tayo. And admittedly, yung child find, hindi na-activate yan eh. So, okay. I'm, I'm now tapping into another agency, which is DSWD and ECCD. Uh, meron kayong statistics. So, at least we have some some number you know, that we can work on. Because without that, it's hard to budget eh. Yes, po. So, uh, paki-provide na lang sa amin. Yes, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're also joined by PIDS. And... Uh, I, during the last hearing, uh, I requested from PIDS to discuss to us the research that they conducted um, on children with disability. And uh, last time they gave us a very broad overview, but I really wanted to go deeper into that research. No? So may I call Dr. Aubrey Tabuga of PIDS? And ba siya? Yes, Mr. Chair. Um, hello. Yes, Aubrey, we can hear you. Yes. Please. Yes, sir. So um, we sent a part presentation. I'm just yes. trying to share. Yeah. During the last hearing, I don't know if you remember, but I requested for a much in-depth discussion on your research on children with disability because uh, it's a good research. I, I read it, but uh, for the information of everyone, uh, I want PIDS to discuss that. No? Okay, sir, let me just go to the uh, PowerPoint presentation. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Yes, perhaps, sir. Can, can you see? Yeah, yeah. Makita na. we can hear. Yes. Thank you. Okay, so um, pardon, Mr. Chair, um, but I'm, I wasn't part of this project. But this is supposed to be the PowerPoint presentation um, of Dr. Celia Reyes. Okay, so, so in this um, study, it uses the census of population data on disability because that census had um, disability variable in, in the census. So let me just go through it very um, fast. So based on the 2010 census, we found that there were 343 or 344 children with disability. That's about um, a little below 1% of children. Okay, so in, in that data, there were more boys than girls who had disability. As you can see here, the blue graph, the blue bars in the graph are are higher than the pink bars um, representing the girls. In terms of um, literacy rate, of course, the persons with disability have the lower literacy rate than the non-persons with disability. Um, okay, so in terms of the population of 10 and over, we are showing you the regional um, disaggregation of the literacy rates. And again, you can see um, the lower literacy rate among persons with disability, wherein ARM would have the lowest um, literacy rate. In terms of the, the profile of this uh, persons with disability and their literacy rates, you can see that it's the youngest and the oldest groups who have um, the lowest um, literacy rates. So you can see here in 2010, for instance, among um, those aged 8 to 14, and then um, among those aged 15 to 19, 
territories to make among the PWD around 78-79%. Um, and if you compare that to the number of patients with disabilities, it's about like 98%. You can also see these uh, disparities um, for the, the author group. In terms of the gender disparities, you can see that um, the literacy rate among male PWDs is lower than among female uh, PWDs. So in terms of school attendance rate of, of children, so you can see here that um, for children younger than 16, in 2010, there was a um, slight improvement in terms of their school attendance rate. But then in 2010, um, the older children had um, declined or had a, had a, uh, a attendance rate of, that is lower than in, 20, in 2000. So that's, that's the trend for, for those um, ages. And then girls with disabilities, they have higher um, school attendance rates than boys, so boys um, are disadvantaged in more general sense. In terms of those um, by age group, as you can see here, um, those attending schools are higher among females, almost for all the categories except for those 20, 21 to 24 years old. So, among five-year-olds, for instance, 41% um, are attending school. These are the children with disability. And then um, among six to 11 years old, that um, climbs to 75%. And then it, it, uh, it declines a bit among older children. So the, the trend in persons with disabilities among uh, the school attendance rate among children with disabilities it's consistent with the school attendance rates among non pedagogies wherein it's the older children that are um, usually almost um, not in school. Okay, so you can see the highest grade completed of PW this age 25 years and over here for also for, for 2010. Um, Mr. Chair, we are using uh, 2010 because I, um, this is the more representative data. Uh, I believe that you've also seen um, a study of BIDS uh, using Mandawa cases and the CPU cases, but uh, for this uh, presentation, we use the 2010 so that we have more room to look at the data. So as you can see here, um, the PWDs, most of them, you can see the, the large bar, large orange bar there. Most of them are elementary undergraduate. If you look at the non-PWDs, uh, at least Madame high school graduate. But of course, when you move down um, to, the, to the higher education attainments, you will see uh, that uh, while more than 10% of non-PWDs um, Rich college only like around seven percent of the PWDs are able to, to reach that level. So if you look at the average years of schooling of PWDs, um, of course it's generally lower than non PWDs. So if we get the the years of average schooling, so at age twelve, um, three point eight lang sa kanila, or three point eight lang average years of schooling as compared to to people in that same age, um, 5.3 um, years. And then for for 16, for 16 year old, um, PWDs, six year average uh, years of schooling nila. And then for 18 year old, 6.9. And then these are um, generally lower than the non PW2 population. So um, we have also um, noted the different um, programs of DepEd for learner, learners with disabilities. And so these are the institutionalization of the programs in all schools, and then strengthening special education program at the basic education level. Um, there's also the ALS, of course, which provide uh, learners with hearing and visual impairment with appropriate learning interventions through the ALS basic uh, literacy program and the accreditation and equivalency program. Of course, you also have alternative double modes. Uh, I don't think I'm gonna. I need to um, mention all of this. So, um, as of February 17, when, when this study was conducted by, by Dr. Celia Rose and her, and her um, staff, uh, there were 648 pet centers 
and regular schools or brings early programs. I think this was um, uh, mentioned earlier uh, by another presenter. And these are also the number of sped teachers up to that um, school year. Okay, so I think it's important to show this um, data, the, the graph showing the disability or disability or impairment of our learners with disabilities. And um, a while ago, there was a, there was a mention that uh, like only 20% of um, children with disability have, um, what do you call this, um, yung malala, yung kanilang condition. But then I, I don't know where, where that came from. But... From here, we, we can see that there's so many um, types of disabilities, and um, that is why it's very important to have this this early diagnostics. Um, because you can see it's it's easy to maybe maybe see maybe see the visual impaired person, and then maybe it's it's very also it's easier to to um, be aware of under your children some um, mobility impaired and yes the visually impaired and the hearing impaired but then it gets more difficult when you look at this learning disability intellectual disability autism spectrum disorder emotional behavior disorder uh, and the other um, uh, types of disability that are difficult to to see um, or to, to be aware of if we didn't have the, the training for it. And so um, these are for elementary uh, level students. I think this came from the DepEd. Um, and then this, this another table shows the that of the secondary level, and it also shows the different kinds of, of disabilities there. So you can see here, for instance, um, for secondary students, secondary level students, yung pinakamalaki po dito number is is those of difficulty seeing. So, and then there are also a lot of them difficult have difficulties remembering, concentrating, okay, attention, and understanding based on manifestation. Okay, so uh, this is the, the figure that I've shown earlier. This just shows um, the trend through the years. Then, so for education, um, what are the, the highlights of the idea studies uh, for education? So when you look at the reasons for not ever going to school and not finishing school, so they, they have a um, consistent find this, consistency in the findings. So number one is the financial problem. Um, and then number two, due to disability. And then number three, the child does not want to go to school. And then number four, family did not allow the child to go to school. Number five, school was not available in the neighborhood. And then number six, no companion going to school, sick or shy, others, um, the, the children prefer to go to. So you know, the reasons for not finishing, but the reasons for not ever going to school, we can already see what is happening there. That um, if you look at the school, maybe hindi siya yung pinaka on top there, but it's the financial problem. And sometimes due to the disability, which also shows us that it's the awareness that um, is problematic sometimes. Dahil sa disability niya, hindi siya ayaw niyang mag-aral. Which um, tells us that maybe they don't have the information on where to go, what to, who to approach. So that's the, that's the, and then the child doesn't want to go to school because probably the child does not know where, the, the family of the child does not have the information on on where to go, what what the assistance, what support of the sick in terms of the, the disability. So awareness, um, Mr. Chair, um, if, if I may just um, try to add to what has been mentioned earlier about diagnostics. Also in our in our position paper, we have highlighted the importance of diagnostics um, because you cannot uh, formulate the, the intervention earlier on if you did not have early diagnostics. And so it was mentioned earlier that it's very important that the CDC staff um, are, are well trained, but also we have to account for children who are not going to school in the first place or who, are not going to, or who do not go to the, the daycare centers because of uh, possibly their, their disability. And so um, one of the studies at BIDS, there was this recommendation of why not um, for, for medical institutions, for instance, medical schools, uh, they, they have to work more closely with the communities because we can um, take advantage of the, the students in these schools 
the, the nursing students, the medical students. Of course, this should be done under the, the supervision of, of professionals. If these uh, institutions or these medical schools have closer interaction with the community, there can be more routine screenings of children within that area. I think that, that is one of the recommendations from the study that, that the IDS did. Another one is that um, there can also be screening, regular screening or more routine screening uh, at the first grade in elementary, as you've seen at the elementary level. Uh, madami pong um, children with disabilities na uh, maybe we haven't seen, hindi natin makita dun sa CDC. And then nakapasok sila sa, sa elementary, they have this uh, disability. And, and also, um, apart from that, someone mentioned about the volunteers uh, in the area. So community awareness is very important for the diagnostics because um, um, especially when our volunteer health workers, kasi ngayon, ang laki na ng, ng, ng role ng ating mga, mga community health workers. Nabanggit kanina yung BNS, the Barangay Nutrition Scholars, maybe the Barangay Health Workers, they can also help in terms of... of um, um, it's really not diagnosis, but really knowing kung sino ba yung batang dapat magpatingin. And of course, because because we we need um, the, the, these children to, to be all included in terms of the diagnosis and the early intervention. Yung role po ng LG, napaka-importante. And so, kanina, there was, uh, there was a person who mentioned about it, sh it shouldn't be at the division, but it, it should be at the district level. Because in division, if I remember correctly, the division is at the provincial level. So in, in my Ilocos, uh, we only have division, Ilocos division, something like that. So people from remote areas would go to, you know, would, would travel very far just to just to access the, the learning resource centers if it will be at the division level and i think it, it's um it's important to look into this now um i can i can understand the, the recommendations a while ago back at the district of course it's near the people a problem po kasi ng mga persons with disabilities that um, lalo na yung mga nahihiya ayaw nilang mag-travel ng malayo ayaw nilang mas, mas exposed but if they were in their community if the, if the their resource centers would be nearer them then they would be they would be mas mas maano natin sila mag-invest dun sa idea na yun na magpatingin sila and also if it were at the district level i think it's more clear than yung yung role ng lgu kasi if it's at the division one of the questions or one of the, the comments that we, we provided um on the PIDS, um position paper is that how are we going to to identify the contributions of the LGUs if it were at the division level? So, so yung mangyayari niyan, ako uh, sa kanyang learning resource center, baka siya lang yung mag-invest doon that the LGU. But if we provide or if we ask all district, school districts to to have, hindi naman siguro sing ganda nung, nung pupunta ang um, establishment or, or facility, uh, say at the city or at the provincial level, but to have like um, a unit of the of that uh, learning resource center closer to the districts than if it, na, na hindi talagang isang, isang division, isang, isang center. So let me, if I can uh, share other aspects of the the PowerPoint. I think I've shown this earlier. Sorry. Okay, so uh, we also had in the analysis um, what we call a, a logistic regression. It's just to, to, to see the correlates of, of attending school among persons with disabilities. And so, uh, as I mentioned earlier, if, if they get older, so among older the people with disabilities, um, they, they have higher chances of stopping school, which I've mentioned earlier. Ito rin yung case po ng ating mga non-PWD or yung, yung overall na mga, mga children natin sa school. Yung mas matatanda, mas nag-drop out na sila kasi either, um, either due to they want to seek employment or because of, of, of financial difficulties. Another uh, factor that's important here in the analysis is that being, being a male or uh, a little baby child, uh, mas mataas din yung kanyang chance of stopping or, or dropping out of school. And then if there are unmet, unmet needs, um, they, they also, the children also drop out of school. Also, if the mother um, 
if the mother has higher uh, education attainment, uh, then uh, mas, mas kakaroon ng chance yung PWDD after the school. Of course, um, being more affluent um, increases the chance on the PWDD uh, to attend school also. And we also found that being a uh, is beneficiary um, um, improves the chance of the, of the PWDD child to be in school. Okay, so the distance in school, which I mentioned earlier, kung malayo yung school, uh, mas nagmamatter din siya. So kung mas matcha ng malayo yung school, um, there is a higher tendency to drop out from the school. So these are the challenges, uh, just, to, just to summarize um, the PowerPoint presentation. So it's lack of awareness on program. Ano ba talaga yun? If I have a child that has a, uh, a disability, saan kami pupunta? We don't know. They, they don't know where to go. And then lack of teachers, of course, and then spend centers. I think that that's mentioned a while ago. We just um, uh, also mentioned this, um, Mr. Chair, that um, as, as mentioned by, by Dr. Uh, Buffus a while ago, classes is very important, especially that we know that teachers have so many non-teaching loads. There's a study at PID as that our teachers are overworked, and so um, um, even if they want to, to gain more um, or education in terms of, of um, how to how to be more inclusive, how to be more aware of, of the disabilities, um, I think that we have to understand also their circumstances. So the use of teacher aids that's, that's really a uh, very very good. And also, it's important that they, these teachers, they do have upward career mobility, the opportunities for upward career mobility, because I think that's the sustainable way to, to, to have this kind of interventions also. And so, so moving on, um, as I mentioned earlier, financial difficulties on the part of PWDs, that's really, really um, one of the main reasons kung bakit um, even hindi, hindi nila gustong mag-aral in the first place. And then even for dropping out, yun din yung, yun din yung main reason, difficulties, financial difficulties. Of course, identification of children with special needs or, or, the, or, or young children, young learners with disabilities um, at the early stage is very important. And, yeah, the infrastructure, of course, um, and the roads sometimes, ang problema ng mga data is that let na yung ating mga mobility is very right? gusto nila. Uh, they need someone to really physically carry them from from their place, from their house to, to, the, to the road, to the tricycles, something like that. So it's very important that we have we have these PWD-friendly uh, infrastructures. And of course, the lack of data. So um, if if LGUs um, are going to have an active role in in addressing or in providing or facilitating inclusive education, I think it's very important that they also have data. And right now, I don't think that we have to wait for another census to know what's really happening. We can perhaps um, take advantage of existing uh, uh, um, information systems like the CBMS, the community monitor, community based monitoring system, it can provide us the disaggregated data that we need as in terms of planning and, and, and the resources or allocation of resources. So I think I've, I've um, mentioned a lot of recommendations already, but let me just go through this very fast, Mr. Chair. So uh, there is a need to devise, devise ways so that PWD, PWD children can attend school regularly, making schools more uh, not just child friendly but also PWD friendly uh, would increase um, the likelihood of children to go to school. We need to increase also the awareness of um, in terms of, of the programs and sessions. Training programs to handle pupils or students with special needs as part of the tooling for children for teachers, the mainstream teachers, um, they may not necessarily have all the, the special specialization, but at least they know or they're aware about this, um, about the, the disability of children, and they can make some referrals to, to schools or to, to other um, professionals for a proper diagnosis. Sorry, let me just... Okay. We need also to enhance the ALS mobile teacher program of DepEd and putting up more respect facilities that cater all uh, types of disabilities. And this will be of great help to families with PWD children. With PWD children. 
We also need to make sure that assistive devices are given to are given to PWDs to match their needs. So one of the, the um, we call this interesting finding in the Cebu um, study of PIDS of with children with disabilities that they are provided um, assistive devices that are not um, that, that do not match their needs. So I think that that's also very important. And um, and as I mentioned earlier, having data will probably help us sort of um, understand kung ano ba yung kailangan nila. So, so kung meron, madami nang kailangan ng wheelchairs, and then so we spend more on that. Pag madami mga kailangan ng, ng uh, occupational therapy or new services ng mga development of pediatrician, uh, doon tayo mag-spend. So it's more about um, generating information that are needed in, in addressing the needs of, of children with disabilities. So we need more special schools on them. We need to increase accessibility to basic facilities, infrastructure, and transportation. Of course, uh, greater advocacy. Uh, we need that. Uh, we need um, not hindi lang yung teachers, but din yung students. Na na mentioned kanina yung mga regular students. They, uh, they also have to be more aware because yung, yung inclusion ng, ng child um, is very important, not just in going to school, but being physically present and being recognized in the school. Financial assistance for children with disability um, is also mentioned in the in the recommendations of the IDS studies because, as I've mentioned earlier, a problem of the financial difficulties. There is a need for partnership among different organizations, step ed, NGOs, and private sector in diagnosing children with special needs for early intervention. And we need universally accessible infrastructure. I think that's that's all, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to PIDS. Uh, do you have any follow-up research on the effects of low literacy rates? Of course, we all know it, it, it's good that we have reason. Uh, uh, rates. Low literacy rates. Hello, Mr. Chair. big, no? Um, if I'm not mistaken, to, so what effect? And why? What? Uh, why is there a low literacy rate uh, among um, children with disabilities? Hello, hello, sir. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yes, sir. I think I heard um, most of the question. So, why do we have a low literacy rate among yeah, do we have, have to, disabilities? Yeah. Why do we have low literacy rates and what are the effects of low literacy rates? Okay. So, let me just start with the effects of the low literacy rate. It, it, this is not about PWDs, um, but we had studies in general, for instance. Um, we had this um, studies about not youth not in education uh, and employment or training. We, we had that, um, Mr. Chair. And then what we found there is that if you have a low literacy rate, what happens is that you cannot get, of course, decent jobs. And when we look at the, the disaggregation of this one, what happened is that yung mga male um, youth who are not in um, employment uh, or education, ang nangyayari sa kanila is they tend to go to jobs that are um, yung mga like, elementary occupations. But to, for the women naman, what happens is that they, they, they do not, um, they, they are NEET or they are not in education and employment. Or employment and, and what happens to them is that they stay in, in in their homes they're doing household chores so ang nangyayari if you have low literacy rate you're you will either be not in the labor force or even if you're in the labor force you would have elementary occupations that's the data that we got in, in our analysis of being not in the labor force or being not in education or training among the youth and what is the the um, 
why are why do PWDs have low uh, literacy rate? Basically, because they are unable to to access schools. So as I've mentioned earlier, you know, those who do not enter school at all, the mga reasons nila is that they don't have um, the capacity, the financial capacity. So for persons with disability, if you are, um, what, what uh, disability itself is a is a cost for for not going to school, and then um, children do not want to go to school. So there is this. Oh, there are lots of studies at the IBS looking into the. Um, the reasons for not going to school is lack of interest. And then when we look at into the more refined characteristics of these children, and, and I suppose this would also apply to persons with disability, is that pag nakikita mo po sila, more, more, more male po yung mga hindi mga ayaw mag -aral eh. So what happens is that they just want to seek employment. So if they, they reach the 14, 15, like the na sila. The others they would say um, um, high cost of schooling, which really reflects na uh, when when a person starts um, high school, may hirapan na silang mag-aral. Um, and um, this has been the finding of the LDS ever since, um, especially when we are looking at the case of the forties, because even if um, even if we give them some amount, meron pa rin mga bata, lalo yung mga older kids, who are able to go to school. So as opposed to the elementary school children, wherein we have elementary schools in almost every barangay in the Philippines, it's more accessible. But when it comes to the high schoolers, the, the problem is, they can out the sila due to many reasons. For, for women, um, most of the, the reasons is that they they become, um, what do you call this? So they're not doing, they, they're doing household chores. Um, they're not gaining any skills. And that's that's for girls and for boys. It's really the, the employment, um, the early employment, and they want to help their family. So it's the really financial constraints also. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tabuga. Thank you for that uh, comprehensive presentation. Um, I want to ask Deped, no? si Dr. Uh, Taginayo. Um, Dr. Taginayo, uh, last time you mentioned we have 231,000 children with disability learners no? or learners with disability in our system. And to read them the plan. Is that there, Dr. Taginayo? Hello, good afternoon, Paul, Mr. Senator. Yes, Dr. Taginayo. If I may ask my, my bureau director, if he is around to, to do the presentation. Sige po. Uh, describe to us how do you plan to reach out to our learners with disability? With disabilities, no. Um, how do you plan to uh, uh, continue their learning and their education? I'm Laila. Yeah. Good afternoon, Honorable Senator Awin, and um, to the other senators. Magandang hapon po sa inyong lahat. Um, may I know if I am heard? Yes, yes. We can hear you very clear. Um. Sir, actually, um, we also prepared a learning continuity plan for a special ed for special education, and so if I may go directly to what we uh, have prepared for our children with disabilities, um, the first thing we did was actually to harvest uh, existing materials that we already have in the different schools, particularly those um, implementing special education. And with the self-learning modules that uh, we have developed for all our typical learners and for every for all our learners, um, the, we're going to convert uh, this uh, self-learning modules to different uh, accessible formats, so that um, there's going to be inclusive uh, e-books or e-module that we're going to have, of which. Um, 
these e-books uh, will be embedded with sign language interpretation and audio will also be provided. For radio and TV, Your Honor, um, the SLMs will be converted to radio scripts and eventually audio lessons. And um, for TV and even for the Deaf and Commons, um, we will also be converting the different uh, self-learning modules to video lessons. And um, part of uh, that video lesson should be that sign language interpretation, Your Honor. Hey, Director, I, I know this is very challenging, you know, but uh, I want to understand fully. In, during the last hearing, I understand um, that DepEd categorized 11 different disability. Is that correct? Director? Yes, Your Honor. Tama po ba? Na mer under the uh, DepEd has DepEd categorized 11 different disabilities in the um, under the special education program. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. So how do you, we have a, uh, I'm just trying to visualize it, no? So does that mean that we will have 11 different learning modules for learners with disabilities? Your Honor, um, there are actually video lessons that are being prepared by our schools, particularly to address the needs of our learners uh, for those who are in self-contained uh, classes. Um, but for the for our for those learners who are already mainstream, uh, that's where the conversion of the SLMs will come in. Your Honor, SLM nila will be the same with any other uh, learner. If you're referring, Your Honor, to the um, children with disabilities who are mainstream, Correct. yes, they will have the same um, SLMs, um, yeah, self-learning modules. However, these self-learning modules will uh, be converted to video lessons and um, sign language interpretation will be um, embedded in this uh, material and audio of course will also also be provided but how do you reach the uh, how would they have access to the videos uh, because um, obviously they're at home and then we will deliver the self-learning modules to them and um, some of these students who are in mainstream they also have specialized uh, intervention in the SPED centers. So, so how do you now um, give them access to the video? And at the same time, what happened to those learners who have special interventions in SPED centers? Uh, actually, Your Honor, this is part of the profiling that uh, should be done, that are being done by our schools. And uh, they really have to look into the devices that our children have in their respective homes. So that uh, for those who have uh, devices or, for example, computers, tablets, and uh, smart uh, smartphones, then they can always access uh, DepEd Commons and um, make use of uh, the different video lessons and audio lessons that are provided there. Um, and then um, for the same, the same, the, uh, the same is true with those who are in contained uh, classes, so, Your Honor. So there's another set, of course, of um, video lessons which our regional offices, um, and uh, in coordination, of course, with our division offices and schools, are actually preparing. Uh, the the schools uh, actually, Your Honor. Um, has um, have strategized on how to reach out to his uh, learners with disabilities. In fact, uh, this is actually part of um, of our efforts during enrollment. That we really have to find out where they are, and uh, if they are enrolling, then we should know um, what to offer them. Are you going to be doing uh, home visits for those who need? uh 
interventions, like for example, a speech therapist. Um, uh, typically, they go to the SPED center to uh, to um, undertake uh, their speech therapy. But um, since wala tayong SPED center ngayon, how do you, uh, are you going to go to their homes and conduct uh, speech therapy and other intervention programs? Meron bang, is that part of the learning continuity plan? Actually, Your Honor, um, the what the our learning facilitators uh, will will be doing is the uh, to assist them actually in on, on how they're going to undertake the different activities as contained in the self learning modules. But as to uh, those services that can be offered uh, by specialists, uh, that's going to be a challenge, Your Honor, on the part of the Department of Education. To be honest enough with it. Yeah, I know it's a big challenge, but uh, I think what we should, um, uh, as a matter of strategy, is first to um, have an inventory or have a list of uh, specialists that can be deployed and uh, how many students require these specialists as, as a matter of uh, strategy. And uh, let's see how we can um fill in the gaps no I, I know it's a challenge and uh um i don't expect uh, i don't expect uh, a definite answer now but i just want to get a broad um overview from deped on how to uh, address the needs of our learners with disabilities considering that they need intervention and also they re they would require uh, their typical mainstream lessons no through the self-learning modules. Uh, bas uh, are we crafting a separate uh, learning continuity plan for our uh, learners with disabilities? Yes, Your Honor, we actually crafted uh, a separate learning continuity plan for SPED. We can uh, send you, a, we can provide you, Your Honor, a copy of this. We can email to you. Oh, sige, pa pa bigay na lang sa akin yung ano yung um, uh, learning continuity plan. And um, in, in terms of um, um, uh, number of children, no? uh, last time I understand that there are two hundred thirty one learners in our system. Uh, how many of those will require? home visits or interventions kasi hindi naman lahat ano eh diba hindi naman lahat kailangan ng intervention some of them are already mainstream no? and some of them uh, are being handled by our teachers but how many of those are uh, how many of those require interventions uh, for now, Your Honor, I cannot give you an answer because uh, enrollment is still going on. But uh, when we'll be able to um, get the number, the total number of enrollment, and identify the our the children with disabilities who are um, who are enrolled and their respective um, uh, disabilities, then certainly, Your Honor, we'll be able to provide you. But I'd like to mention, Your Honor, that uh, home visits may not uh, just be done to children who cannot just manage their own learning. But they will certainly be the priority. But our children with disabilities will certainly be visited also. Uh, they'll be included in the, 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 the route also of our uh, SPED teachers, Your Honor. Yeah, I would like to, uh, uh, Director, I would like to uh, uh, again emphasize to the Department of Education to uh, try as hard as possible to reach out to our children with disabilities. Uh, this COVID has tremendously marginalized our children, more so children with disabilities, because nakita naman kanina natin doon sa PIDS, uh, they encounter a lot of uh, inherent um, challenges. No, For example, mobility is one, accessibility of schools is another one, Finance uh, challenges, financial challenges is another. Uh, in the list of PIDS, these are inherent for families with children with disabilities. So um, I'd like to uh, again emphasize to DepEd to uh, 
uh, make sure that they are not left behind. And um, uh, I, I know for a fact that uh, the um, uh, divisions are ready to help, but uh, we need some guidance and direction from DepEd Central to mobilize them. We just need to try our very best to reach out. Kawawa naman sila if we don't uh, reach out to them. Co Chair, may I make an Yes. Yes, uh, Senator Pia. Thank you. Mr. Chair, um, since we have a lot of, um, we have representatives from uh, DepEd and uh, experts from UP, PNU, and NGOs here, I'd like to just share that uh, uh, in, in a couple of hearings that I chaired and attended, so yesterday there was a hearing on uh, the Committee on Urban Planning on one of the bills I filed, which is Sustainable Cities and Communities. And then in the other hearing that uh, uh, this committee is, uh, is um, also is a part of on uh, the future of education, um, it has become very clear that we really make, need to make changes to adapt to not just the new norm, but alternative futures. So as we discuss this bill, Mr. Chair, I would like our resource persons to really give us a wish list. We know that it is not quite possible, no, especially with the pandemic that we're dealing with, to find the funding for all of that. But I believe it's very important that we have a vision of these possible futures, and it should be good futures no? that we are preparing for, um, so that those who are most vulnerable, and that includes uh, the children with um, disabilities, special needs, and the like, uh, they will not be as marginalized as they already are. So in other words, if we can prepare for these futures, and these futures would include another pandemic, it will happen again. It will include natural disasters. It will include economic crisis. Sa tawag nga nila, a crisis over a crisis. What safeguards can be put into place that would allow them to continue to thrive or in the worst case scenario, not get left behind. So um, the one one takeaway I had from the hearing yesterday was it boils down also to the importance of health. So can you imagine if a child with special needs uh, already has so much difficulties and then has to deal with COVID, hindi nga makalabas, hindi man lang makapunta dun sa therapy place niya, sabihin mo nang meron siyang one-on-one -on -one classes, hindi naman makarating yung kanyang teacher, yung kanyang therapist, doble-doble yung um, uh, sacrifices and the uh, uh, um, disadvantage that these children would suffer. So my point is, we need to think of those futures and already put in uh, the structure, whether they are infrastructure or they are plants or they are human resource. We need to put that into place, right? And even if we can only do it one step at a time, at least yun yung direction. So in other words, kung sasabihin din na uh, the goal really is that um, meron silang access sa kanilang special ed teachers or sa kanilang uh, rehab specialist, whether PT or, or occupational therapy. Or, e di ngayon pa lang, napaklano na rin natin, lagay na rin natin sa bill kung ano yung human resource na kailangan natin for that. So that's my point lang, Mr. Chair, yung intervention ko. May I ask the resource persons to include in their recommendations that best case scenario, kung ano yung nakikita niyo sa mga developed countries, yun yung i-aspire natin na ma-achieve. Hindi yung parang dito lang tayo. Okay, yun lang, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Sir Pia, can you repeat the last uh, two minutes of your uh, uh, remarks? Medyo nag-choppy siya eh, but I, I, it's a very important uh, closing uh, remark eh. The last, itong sure. last few sentences. Sure. Is my audio good now? Is it good now? Uh, May naman, yeah. yeah, okay na. Okay, okay na ngayon. Yeah. So what I was saying is I would like the resource persons to provide the recommendation of how we can address these gaps that the most vulnerable sector, which is these children with special needs, currently have. How do we address those gaps in the future? And since we are we know for a fact we cannot address this overnight, we cannot address this in one year, but we can have a long-term plan. Okay, that's precisely what 
sustainable education is about. That is what the future of education is about. That we know what those alternative futures are like. Like what if it is a future that has a lot of health problems, no may pandemic pa, or it has a, um, natural disasters. How do you carve out just how do you how do you prepare our physical infrastructure, our healthcare services, the human health care resources, and the plans to ensure when those crises come in the future, we are best prepared for it. Hindi na le left behind itong sector na ito. So, for example, lang, um, if you would say that they just need access to their special ed teacher and their therapist, whether it's a physical therapist, an occupational therapist. So how do you assure that access? Well, number one, we should ensure that we have that human health care resource. So the bill could also include that, no? that, that it will be required that DOH um, does a, a health, human health survey, human health care resource survey, so that we know DOH and DepEd. We know how many sped teachers, how many um, health inter intervention specialists do we need. Kasi di naman tayo makakapag-move forward. Hindi man lang natin alam yung numbers, yung numbers na yun. So, so I'm just saying that, that their specific recommendation should be built in and submitted. So that whether we include it in the law itself or we turn it over for um, the implementing rules, at least sa atin, as lawmakers, clear tayo kung ano yung vision na yun, including even possibly um, budgetary requirements for the next 10 years as we put it into place. Something like that, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Senator P. I do agree that uh, um, we cannot stop just because we don't have the budget or the numbers or the requirement looks staggering. Uh, we, what we need is a vision in an organized process to achieve that vision, whether next five years, next 10 years, uh, but reducing that into a law gives us a direction. Eh? So I do subscribe that and uh, I would like to uh, encourage our resource person to um, submit to us the um, uh, the uh, requirements from Center Cayetano so we can uh, consider that also in the bill and also in her proposed measure in um, the uh, Urban uh, Development uh, Committee. And um, you also have some friends from the Deaf Education Council represented by Dr. Uh, Liza Martinez. First of all, apologize for uh, not providing an interpreter during the first part of this uh, hearing. Uh, I sincerely apologize for that and I take full responsibility uh, for not providing the uh, necessary um, interpreter, but I would like to thank uh, Ms. Ember Parpa for joining us in the middle of this uh, um, uh, hearing. Um, he, she is the Secretary of the Philippine National Association of Sign Language Interpreters. So thank you, Ma'am Ember, for uh, joining us. And uh, we recognize now um, Dr. Liza Martinez, who represents the Deaf Education Council. I'm your recognized book. Uh, Ma'am, nakamute po kayo. Ayan. Well, yan, okay na ho. Yan, yan. Okay na. Okay na po. Yeah, and we can hear you. Okay. Um, thank you for giving the opportunity to share some input. I'm sorry I could not accommodate the request to be the interpreter because the discussion is too important and I, I cannot take on two roles because I don't understand anything. Um, we submitted a statement from the Deaf Education Council and uh, it is specific to the Deaf. But I and other members of the council, as well as uh, Carolyn Dagan, who is here as the president of the Philippine Federation of the Deaf, um, Yvette Corrado, 
and uh, Luella Farr, who are all deaf, are all members of the Deaf Education Council. Um, we are all in full support of colleagues who have mentioned cross-disability inclusiveness because of the UNCRPD. So we are very definite about that and all of the various cross-disability concerns which have been raised by the DSWD, by the ECCDC, uh, the PIDs for literacy concerns. But despite this, we would like to highlight that deaf learners are in quite a unique position, which I tried to explain in the past uh, TWG. Um, deaf learners are already protected by three laws regarding their education. These are landmark laws. And it is a tragic reality that despite this, and this might be the fourth law, which will include uh, deaf learners, despite this, many times deaf people feel that they are still left behind. So I think, Mr. Chairman, there is a huge challenge for this law not to be the fourth law which doesn't work. Um, and it is important to take two perspectives. I have four points that I'd like to go through quickly. I know that there are other people who still want to take the floor. We have very specific recommendations in terms of the phrasing of specific sections. And we base this on Senate Bill 171. Uh, sections 2 to 4, 6 to 12, 15, 17, 18, 21, and 22. Those are details, but the principles that I would like to emphasize right now are, one, you were, you were asking about terms early on in the meeting, and unfortunately, this will complicate that concern much more, because deaf people by two unique um, categories. One is that they are considered as children and learners with disabilities and are therefore entitled to all the recognition of their rights according to the CRPD and all related domestic rights. And the other one, which is not as commonly known and recognized, is that deaf people are legitimate members of a language group. Therefore, they are aligned much more closely with the indigenous groups because they have their own language and culture. And the third law which is our 1766 Filipino Sign Language Act. It's very explicit about this. It, it, that just needs to be implemented. <laughs> we need to get the IRR going. But that is a very critical recognition because no other chairman group has this many domestic laws and has a very clear cross-sectional uh, and intersectionality with language and culture. So that that is that category. So we're talking about children with special needs, learners with disabilities. Then we just have the category of the with the big letter D, which is a cultural category. So this is unique and, and this is a challenge. That's the first point. Um, the second point, and, and I am in full agreement with what the Honorable Senator Kia Petano has just described in terms of looking at the landscape as of now. And I was actually looking for, and I was a little bit disappointed that uh, the chair's um, proposed House Bill 1565 on the new normal education was, was not included here. And I am hoping that the concept of inclusiveness should start as early as now, while we are still in crisis. I am also looking at it in the context of, for instance, in the house, because of the fast tracking of the new normal or the better normal here, actually includes very pertinent uh, section to what we are discussing. In addition, we're Senate Bill 1 by Senator Lapid. 
based on a very strong by the sector regarding disability allowances, a monthly social pension, which we are talking about finances and how do you finance all of the many diverse needs the various impairment groups. So all of this, I think this is the challenge that we need to look at everything. Education is not going to proceed by itself or in a vacuum. It needs to be in the context of everything which is happening around us. And one of this, uh, which has been uh, included in one of the Senate bills, is the hiring of deaf teachers. And we haven't talked a lot about the human resources in terms of, well, we've talked about them in general in terms of support and the learning resource centers. But there is a there's a big catch in our, for instance, the blended learning that the DepEd is proposing, in that if you are getting members of the family, for instance, to facilitate learning at home, many of the parents don't know how to sign. And they are also very much occupied with survival at this point, concerns regarding food, transportation, jobs. And it will be very difficult for them to be learning how to sign and to be effectively be the facilitators of learning at home. The other, so, and this, these are, this is a feature which is already in the law for the Filipino Sign Language Act. The hiring of deaf teachers, and we're currently engaged with uh, trying to look at the NPC through the Bureau of Curriculum Development. And, and we are envisioning tapping the network of deaf organizations of the National Federation to assist at the local level, at the community government level, so that uh, many of the 648 centers where the deaf students are located can at least have a direct uh, deaf resource person who can support them. Um, so that's the second point in terms of uh, human resources. The third is, I already touched on it a little bit, the COVID context. Uh, all four myself and uh, the three deaf people, as well as the Denise Bustos, are members of the Filipino Sign Language Access Team for COVID-19. And we have been a volunteer group which really had to move, start moving middle of March because there were just huge gaps in information and communication. News was not being interpreted and it's, uh, primarily through our group that there are now insects in three TV channels, but it has been a tremendous amount of energy and um, effort to try to bridge gaps of accessibility. The COVID context, like we mentioned, I mentioned earlier, blended learning will be dependent on online access. And one of the, uh, uh, fortunately, one of the provisions which we were able to get into the house better normal deal is with the DICE and making sure that online access is not just available, but it is strong enough for video streaming. Kasi po, ang pag-senyas will really be dependent on video. In fact, the expense for data, video, is many times higher than just regular online. So the way we use data as of now with our deaf colleagues, yun pung only one week is gone in one or two hours of data. So you can imagine the kind of expense the families are facing as of now in terms of this. So the blended learning in terms of the platform are, are really critical. I was very happy to read in, uh, the new normal Senate bill that the chair has proposed that it opened with the children's television app. We feel the television has great potential as a platform because it will be essentially free, well, much cheaper than using online access. So we anticipate that this will be a tremendous barrier and we really end up including rather than including deaf learners. Um, the fourth point, and I'd like to finish with this, is regarding financing. And I'm happy to know that uh, this has already been brought up to point. And um, our, our sector, actually we work very closely with Social Philippines and 
Uh, Ms. Dagani and I have been putting in efforts to submit alternative budget proposals to consider, reconsider actually the earmarking of general appropriations for learners with disabilities. And we are actually proposing a 0.1% earmarking for the agency budget. This is reminiscent of the earmarking for the second decade of persons with disabilities, which earmarked 1% per agency budget for, for all um, appropriations. This is also to note that it has been in as a, as a general provision of the GAA annually that each agency, including the DepEd and the DICP and the DSWD and the, the DOH and the DOLET, need to include in their mandated plans um, services for persons and learners with disabilities in terms of DepEd. I think this is this is really important to sustain and consistent appropriation in institutionalized. Another um, uh, I'm sure this body, the Senate body, is aware that through the intervention of Senator Lapson, um, there was a long time annual budget item in the GAA for instructional materials, textbooks and instructional materials for the handicapped of 100 million annually. Uh, this existed in the uh, beginning 2010, disappeared for a while in the GAA. Uh, Senator Lapson was able to get back half of it, 50 million, in the 2019 budget. And this year, it is back to 100 million. And Mr. Chair, we would like to appeal that this will really go to where it should go to. Uh, the discussions have been many and, and productive, but there are a lot of institutional barriers. We hope you can look into this so that it can be tapped even for as well as during the pandemic. Um, and the last point is that as I, as I go back to the first point that I mentioned about deaf learners being part of a legitimate language group, the Deaf Ed has budget items in, in its GAA for the multi-based multilingual education program, and there are there are as of now 19 recognized mother languages, spoken languages. FSL is recognized by law, and even by R8 10410, the Early Years Act, and also the Enhanced Basic Education Law, that FSL is the first language. And as I mentioned earlier, unfortunately, it is a tragic reality that this is not, no, nothing has been spent for this. But we feel that it can be done. Perhaps now is, is a good rationalization and justification to use it. Because uh, recognizing FSL has, has a tremendous impact on literacy. That's why the, the data of the piece is very, very important. Uh, without strong foundation in Filipino sign language, literacy in a written language is very, very poor. And we know we found this out by experience. In mid-March, when we started working our FSL access team for COVID-19, our efforts in trying to get DOH information regarding what COVID was, how do you protect yourself, what are the symptoms, what do you do, it was multiplied three times, four times as much because we had to work with Filipino information materials. This is because the educational system has almost exclusively emphasized English only for deaf learners, such that a typical educated college graduate deaf adult will barely be able to read and understand Filipino sentences. This is a tragedy, not just for literacy, not just in a pandemic when your life depends on understanding information, but just for general employment opportunities. Deaf people are unable to interact with their parents, cannot text you. If you text them in Filipino, they won't understand. If you have captions in Filipino, they will not be able to appreciate it because everything has to be in English. And it goes back to an education decision that literacy will be exclusively in English. 
And so these are some of the things which have excluded deaf people, not just in schools, but in entire society. So the impact, you were asking uh, Dr. Tabu earlier, what are the effects of poor literacy? You see it very clearly in the deaf. And, and it, the roots are in education. But we can rectify that. Let's, let's work on the NPD MLE. Let's use the funds for it and help us to get the IRR going. Thank you, Mr. Che. Thank you, uh, Dr. Martinez, for that uh, very comprehensive feedback. And uh, thank you very much for uh, uh, shedding light to some of the issues surrounding our deaf community, especially unimplemented laws. Um, I just want to ask you, um, uh doctor now earlier you mentioned um, the uh our deaf community is one of the most marginalized no and uh, i just want to ask in the context of of basic education no uh and from your experience why are they marginalized because you, like you said you have three laws already governing the community and um I just want to understand what are the uh, gaps uh, within those three laws and how do we address them in this new law? This new law, this, it, it, the aim of this new law is to uh, promote inclusive education and at the same time fill the gaps being experienced by learners with disabilities. So the question is, how come they're marginalized no? in light of our education system? Mr. Chair, as, as far back as 2005, which is already uh, 15 years ago, the Philippine Federation of the Deaf established the National Sign Language Committee as a response to then Secretary Raul Rojo who had a presentation with deaf leaders and asked them, what's wrong with education for deaf people? And they had one simple answer. They said, we don't understand the teacher. Can you imagine going to school without understanding the teacher? No wonder, as Dr. Tabuga pointed out, why would deaf people want to go to school if they, if they don't understand the teacher? What for? And communication and information, unlike, for instance, barriers in physical environment, is a minute by minute, second by second accessibility process. I'm not saying that physical barriers are not important. They're very difficult. However, if you are able to arrive at your school, hopefully your problems have been resolved. But for a deaf person, deaf learners can be inside their classroom, they can be next to their teacher, but they are virtually physically absent because they have no idea. And I, I think you can see how Carol reacted, you know, holding up signs. Because can you imagine being here and not being able to access the information? Teachers, the, the training and capacitation of teachers is critical and fortunately there are many beginning steps we're, we're trying to work with through um curriculum There's, we have started with the most essential learning competencies working with uh, a core group with GTP, and we are talking about trying to carry curriculum through and so we're trying to think at okay what we may have starting to think about at this point in terms of uh, training and it's a tall order because we have a very short period of time so teachers the second well i've already mentioned curriculum third materials and this is where the platform is very critical there are no fsl materials why is that fsl is kind of unique because it's a traditional language you cannot do it on print well, you can but it's going to be very poor Fortunately, with all of the ICTs right now, video technology is much more within reach, even by ordinary students like me. You can make a video, deaf people, the P of D can come up with FSL stories, 
and actually use this in education. So this is where we're also trying to mobilize and the deaf community has, has established its cooperative deaf people trying to make materials out of their own language. So partnership between the deaf and deaf people's organizations is essential. If there is no capacity within Dep Ed or TESDA or CHED at this point to look at FSL as a true language, as a virtual and a space, spatial, three-dimensional language, deaf people have to be part of the process because it is their language. And this is how we have been tweaking MELCs to the Deaf Education Council. We have looked at all of the uh, well, just for the mother tongue, looking at all of the about 200 learning competencies and see whether these are appropriate or not for deaf people and for FSL as a visual language. So, kung yun lang po, matumbuk natin. Teachers, train them, retool them if necessary, train the young teachers so that they become signers. And Dr. Therese Busas mentioned something earlier, which is very critical, and it, which is actually in the law, to have deaf teachers and or local government deaf teacher aides so that there is a role model inside the classroom. So that the teacher, maybe a hearing teacher, might be attending to everybody else in the classroom, might not know how to sign, and if there's no interpreter, but if you have a deaf adult there, a big part of your problems will be solved. So human resources, curriculum, training, material. Sorry, that's that. It's, it's really a systems approach. Inclusive education, you were asking, kept on asking all of us, what does it mean? It means education for all. The system must be universally defined. I, I disagree with the perspective that learners with disabilities will not come to school because of their disability. It is not the fault of the individual or the learner. It is because the system is not universally designed to be able to accommodate them. So if I were deaf and I don't understand my teacher and I'm just going to sit there, maybe I won't be motivated to go to school. And maybe the parents will just say, ay, wag, wag na lang ikaw ang pumasok, yun na lang kapatid mo, na lang makarinig, kasi mas nakikinabang sila. And that's a, that's a tragic reality, and this is documented by research. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Martinez. Uh, I would like to open the floor now to the uh, other resource persons who would want to uh, uh, comment on the bill or uh, expound on their position paper. Uh, we've invited some um, resource persons to uh, uh, join us in the conversation. So I would like to open the floor. Anyone who wants to um, uh, to, to, to discuss uh, points on the uh, Meron pong, uh, meron pong, uh, who wants to uh, comment on the bill po? Kung uh, wala naman po, uh, wala po. Any, anyone po? From the League of Cities of the Philippines. Sige, the League of Cities, the favorite uh, league in the yes, entire Okay. I could have from Mr. Chair. Um I would like to reiterate our uh, go, go ahead. special education fund. Okay. Yes. Um, so um we would like to reiterate that we support the language of SDN fifty five sixty nine and one seventy one year bill Canada because it is less prescriptive that it says it may allow portions of the UNICEF compared to other bills which mandate the UNICEF. So we want to promote use of, of local autonomy for, of, for the UNICEF, especially now with so many educational needs of our children. So it is up to the LG to decide um, what are their priorities for LG. So support the language of bills which are just suggest that the UNICEF may be used along with other um, along with other funds such as the general fund 
and the development fund to cater for the needs of the children. So we would you like to manifest that again for the consideration of the community? Thank you. Okay. So you, you, you're, what you're saying is you support the word may? It may instead of shall. Okay. So, okay. We, we uh, take note of that. Any more uh, comments from the body? If uh, meron pa tayong comments. Yes, Mr. Chair. Yes, Sir. Rebecca, and then I recognize. Sir. And then uh, recognize. Uh, Micah, you go ahead. And then we recognize. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just like to add to what uh, Ms. Maymay from. DSWD mentioned earlier because it's also in our position paper that uh, in order for um, LGUs to also address the inclusive education of young learners, particularly those in our child development centers, in national child development centers, is for them to adopt the system for prevention, early identification, referral, and intervention in their LGUs. So if the LGU already has a system um especially for referral they would know where to uh where to direct children with disabilities and their families should they need further help and um in the report that i provided the system for early identity early uh, si system for prevention early identification referral and intervention uh we submitted it as along with our position paper. Um, it mentioned that from the research that was done, out of 30, in a class of 30 children in a center, um, child development workers would usually encounter around two children with disabilities, or at least would manifest um, delays in their development or speech or would show uh, hyperactivity. Um, I would also like to share that sometimes the LGU does, does overlook these uh, children. Um, we have had experience with LGUs admitting that they have had um, mainstream plans for uh, animals, for, uh, for their uh, elderly, but not necessarily for children with disabilities, especially in the early years. So I think if they would could include that they adopt this system. Uh, I think it strengthens also um, what the ECCD Council has already started uh, in accordance with Latin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Micah. Mr. Garcia, and then after we recognize uh, Dr. Serbo. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I just want to reiterate for you in terms of provision on procedural safeguards that I started talking about earlier. This is the section in the law that will spell out how the educational rights provided to children and parents under this law will be protected. This will be the legal monitoring mechanism that the provisions in the law will in fact be implemented. Dr. Martinez, there are three laws already on FSL which are not being implemented. We actually passed a lot of laws uh, that are that are having difficulties in implementation. So we thought that with all the good intentions of this law, we should provide a provision that will ensure that these good provisions will in fact be implemented and protected. But the provision will not only cover IEP, but will cover all areas related to the provision of free and appropriate education. Example of Guru would be placement options or placement programs, for example, Magaral Yung Bata, confidentiality of information, parent participation, access to records, or, or even disciplinary measures that will be imposed on the children. So, napaka importante ho na siguraduhin natin kung ano man ang mga provisions na ibibigay ng batas na ito ay may implement at protectahan ng, ng ating batas. Ito hong provision ng safeguard Procedural safeguards ay pinanggap na rin ng lower house at yung draft bill na pinasa nila on second reading, pero ng provision on procedural safeguards. Uh, salamat, uh, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you. We recognize Dr. Shirley Serbo of ENU. 
Okay, uh, good afternoon, sir. I would just like to reiterate on what was presented earlier by Dr. Custodio. Uh, I would like to reiterate that it is really important that the resource center be connected with the teacher training institutions. Why? Because it is there where the free service teachers are taught. And so if they have uh, more knowledge about what could be done to help these learners with special needs or these uh, students with um, additional needs, then it would be more helpful. And considering as well that um, we have the bill that is to be passed with regards to inclusive education, um, we would like also to recommend that additional, probably additional subjects must be added to the curriculum of those who are taking up uh, teacher tra uh, education. Why say? Because as of the moment, like in our university, we have one professional education course, which is introduction to special and inclusive education, but we believe that it's not enough. So if it, we have one for special education and another one for inclusive education, I believe that we would be able to address the needs more fully. And then lastly, uh, it's good that we really have to capacitate the teachers as regards handling learners with um, additional needs. But the point is, considering the fact that we are now in a pandemic, is the parents who also should be capacitated how in their own ways they would be of help as regards the condition of their children and how they could be capacitated so that learners with special needs will continue learning and will not be left behind considering the situation that we have now so yun lang sir yung gusto ko pong idagdag or isunsog sa aming na sabi kanina with regards to the position paper of the ending. thank you so much thank you thank you uh, and our last uh, 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 person to comment is Ms. Uh, Dagani. Car uh, Caroline Dagani. Uh -uh. So, si Ma'am Ember po ang mag. Uh... Can we highlight, Ms. Dagani? So, um, when we highlight Ms. Dagani, we can see her, sorry. Where is Ms. Dagani? Okay, I see her in the box. Okay. Okay, go. Good afternoon. And um I have some concern about the death. Sorry, sorry. Um, can we can we move on to the video? Because it's not here. It's in a very small video. Ano yan? Um, Your Honor, pwede po maka bigger lang yung video ni Miss Carol because I cannot see her. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, or ma-highlight siya something. Sorry. So can we do that for Sorry,
Doc Lisa, you can see you have a video. Um, you need to pin the video. Um, there's an icon. But if you click on it, you will pin Carol, so her frame will be there. The video is very small. I can see it. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, Senator, um, uh, I have some concern about the of DDW FSL in the participation telling us about deaf teachers. Ah, you mentioned about the deaf teachers. Um, Ad Amber, would you like to yes, wait? Sorry, no, I really can't. Uh, good afternoon to all. I have a concern regarding Republic Act 11106, which has a section, section four, this Filipino sign language used in education, which should be hiring deaf teachers. There are many, many graduates in education with a course in education nationwide in the Philippines, but many of them fail the licensure exam for teachers. Why is this? Because the, the standardized test is not matched to the competencies for which deaf graduates are prepared. There are Filipino items, vocabulary, there is music questions, so they fail the left. So this is not, does not give a fair chance to deaf education graduates and to the deaf teachers to be teaching our deaf children. There are many, many teachers who pass the licensure exam, but they do not know how to sign. And they are learning sign language as a later language. If you are able to give a chance to deaf teachers who are education graduates, then they, deaf, their impact, the influence of deaf learners can be very, very effective. But they're stuck with these institutional exams. So we need this kind of reform so that deaf teachers can enter the education system as teachers. Throughout Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao, we have many, many deaf education graduates. They just give up. The exam is not fair for deaf takers. They end up as tutors who take very low paying jobs, even as college graduates, because they are unable to pass the letter. And this is this is not inclusive at all. This is an institutional barrier. And so it is important for deaf teachers. The same for interpreters. There is a problem for accessibility of information. Very frustrating for us. This is discriminatory, even for teachers and interpreters. And I have gone to many different nationwide, and there is, I can see all of the frustration, the marginalization of these persons. So please, can you please assist us in reforming the licensure exam? And this actually is in the RRR for Death Act. 
because these subjects in, in college are, are very important for courses that they take as part of the teacher preparation program. Another concern that I have is regarding FSL materials. We are stuck regarding production because of procurement policy. Because FSL is a visual language, is unable to hurt the barriers of procurement. So for RE11136, it is important that persons with disabilities are included. And so we are actually proposed that a certain percentage of materials should be used for the development of Filipino sign language materials. We have tried to propose the Department of Education for the production of FSL materials, but this was thumbed down. And we are stuck because of all of these institutional policies and procurement. They only looked at FSL materials as supplementary materials. But we were stuck and frustrated. Please understand that this concern for, for hearing people. We have tried to discuss this and make materials. There are many of them who produce materials, but they don't include tech people. They are essentially creating, creating and inventing materials, and they are marginalizing as we are unable to participate as deaf persons. And so learners are unable to improve in terms of their learning process. You need to include us and deaf teachers as well. There are many deaf teachers who are very skilled and competent. Please help us. So the deaf ed will also give a chance to give a voice to deaf people who have tried our best to advocate for this. Deaf ed order 21 on the policy guidelines for the K-12 law. We have yet to hear of very specific provisions regarding those concerning learners with disabilities and the deaf. We have two other laws, R-503, Republic Act 10 for 10. And these are all have talked about and, and what has happened to all these resistance, and including the FSL Act, RA-111. So please do help us. This is our appeal, especially for deaf teachers. And plus, lastly, my concern for education and interpreters. Teachers are being tapped as interpreters and they go back and forth between these two roles. I think that that is not correct. This should be separate positions. Teachers should teach and interpreters will interpret. There is a great deal of energy and training which is necessary to be an interpreter. You can contract services for interpreters. Do not pull away teachers from the teaching role. We want, we need to teach, teach us. And they cannot be pulled away from their teaching role just to interpret. So we're asking why this is okay. Is it purely just a policy concern? We earnestly appeal for your help. We feel that this is really exploiting teachers because they are asked to do so many different things, but not to teach. This should be a separate position. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, <clears throat> we'll take note of your concern and rest assured that um, uh, we will um, look into some of the issues and uh, some of the items that you have raised. Uh, on a later date, we'll probably, I'll probably ask for another meeting with Dr. Martinez and the rest of the group to go uh, deeper into the issues um, so that I will understand and act, uh, find solutions and act accordingly. So thank you, thank you very much. And um, to the rest of the group, uh, thank you very much for your participation. Senator Pia, any last words? Uh, is Senator Pia still there? Or Senator Binay, any last words? Um, kung wala naman po, well, thank you very much for your time to all our resource persons. Uh, this hearing is truly uh, a very important one in crafting um, this is inclusive education bill. Um, I, we have gathered a lot of information. We will tweak the bill according 
to your inputs and to your suggestions. Um, we uh, encourage everyone to submit to us your position paper, kung meron man, uh, on or before July 9, because after that we will enter into a technical working group. So kung meron pa kayong mga pahabol na position paper, feel free to submit it to us on or before July 9. And uh, we will inform you of the technical working group. As you all know, the technical working group is where the battleground is because we will go into provision by provision. So um, uh, we will also invite you to join us there and uh, to to uh, get uh, detailed comments on the uh, on the proposed laws. So with that, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for your inputs. Um, marami ho tayo na cover today, but uh, uh, it's really an honor for uh, for me to discuss this very important bill no, with all of you. So I'll see you in the technical working group. Po. So meeting is uh, this uh, here. Uh, this hearing is hereby adjourned. Thank you.